information that he requires to hand and therefore I'm happy to take it away and to supply further information to the member. Thank you. We now move to the next item of business, which is a debate on motion number 13046 in the name of Mark Griffin on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. Members may wish to note that British Sign Language interpreters are present in the Chamber and will be signing this debate. Members will also wish to note that the Parliament today received an award from Action on Hearing Loss for a charter mark, which is a nationally recognised accreditation for organisations who offer excellent levels of service and accessibility for people who are deaf or have hearing loss. Can I call on Mark Griffin to speak to and move the motion? Mr Griffin, 14 minutes. Thank you, President Officer, and I congratulate the, the Parliament on the excellent service that I've always um, found to be provided for constituents um, who are deaf and use BSL as their um, first language, and congratulate you on the award the Parliament's received. And for me, this is a very happy day. It's a great honour um, for me to open today's debate on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. I'd like to take this opportunity to thank the Education and Culture Committee, the Finance Committee and the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee um, for their considered scrutiny of the Bill and to all of those who have worked so hard to get the Bill to this point. I'm delighted with the reaction that has been to the Bill. Um, it's clear that from the many submissions received by the Education and Culture Committee that there is a real desire for a piece of standalone legislation that will promote awareness and protect the language and its culture. I'd also like to thank the Minister for Learning, Science and Scotland's Languages, Dr Alistair Allen, and his officials for the open and constructive discussions in relation to the bill. And I look forward to working, them with, the, working with them in the future, um, given that we have a, hopefully a successful vote at, at five o'clock tonight. Now, members may recall that back in 2010, former MSP Cathy Craigie consulted, conducted a, a consultation on a proposed British Sign Language Bill. And although the aim of my bill is different to that of the one Cathy Craigie was proposing to introduce, the work done by Cathy and the cross-party group on deafness uh, went a long way in informing what we have here in front of us today. British Sign Language is the first language of many deaf people in Scotland. BSL is a visual gestural language which uses space and movement. The hands, face and head are used to communicate and it has a different grammatical structure to English. Across Scotland, BSL is the indigenous manual language in the same way that English is the indigenous spoken language. Deaf people who use BSL are part of a recognised cultural and linguistic minority. And unlike other people who speak other minority languages, many deaf sign language users can't learn to speak English as they can't hear the language. The origins of forms of sign language can actually be traced back to the, the seventh century. In fact, in 1886, a short story penned by Charles Dickens titled Dr. Marigold's Prescription was published. And that story was about a, a deaf girl called Sophie who is rescued from a violent father by a man who adopts her and then devises a form of sign language in order for them to be able to communicate um, with each other. Now, before I go on to discuss the aim of my bill in more detail, I'd like to mention a specific group of BSL users in Scotland who use BSL in a, a different way, and people within the deaf-blind community. It, it's estimated that 11% of deaf-blind people use BSL as their first language, and they, of course, all access that language in a distinctive way. Now, there are a couple of different names for that method, whether that's hands-on signing, tactile, BSL, deafblind manual, um, to name 
a few. And I, I want to assure members of the deaf blind community that I consider the needs of all BSL users to be equally important, regardless of the way in which they access the language. The, the Minister, at his last appearance before the Education and Culture Committee, stressed the point that the needs of the deaf blind community would be taken into consideration in the implementation of the bill, and that he was determined that the deaf blind community would be represented on the advisory group, which would be set up if the bill was passed. Now, I hope that will reassure members of the deaf blind community that their needs have been considered at all stages during the development of this bill and that they will continue to feature prominently in its implementation. I've also been in discussion with Deaf Blind Scotland over the possibility of an amendment to the bill to ensure that the involvement of Deaf Blind BSL users is guaranteed and that's something we are actively um, looking at um, for the purposes of stage two amendments um, and that's something um, that we'll look to introduce once the legal consequences um, of any amendment are, are fully considered. Now, the aim of this bill is to encourage the use of BSL in Scottish public life and raise awareness of the language amongst the hearing population. Now, this bill won't give BSL users any rights or impose service obligations on authorities. And as such, the bill isn't directly about the service needs of BSL users. Its focus is more about promoting the language and all the benefits that will flow from that. Now, unfortunately to, to date, there still remains a lack of awareness and understanding of BSL amongst the hearing population. This lack of understanding and awareness has meant that deaf people not only have less access to the same information as service and services as hearing people, but this can often lead to them feeling marginalised, shut out, misunderstood and isolated. By the same token, society is also missing out on the contribution that deaf and deaf and deafblind people can make because they don't have the same access to education and the workplace as, as hearing people do. Yep, certainly. Uh, thank you very much. Given, for giving way, given that 90% of deaf children are born to hearing pa parents, would the member also support going forward an amendment that help, would help to support family sign language provision because there's no doubt that if the family can sign, that's an enormous help to the child. So as well as BSL for family needs, there's no government provision at the moment for that. Mr Griffin? Yeah, that's obviously a, a big gap in service provision. As uh, Mary Scanlon points out, the vast majority of deaf children are born to hearing parents, hearing siblings, hearing grandparents. And... Uh, I think I'm right in saying that it was a commitment, maybe if not all, but in most parties' manifestos in the 2011 elections here for the Scottish Parliament. So I hope that um, this bill does act as a, as a vehicle for the government to implement that, that pledge that was within its, its manifesto. Um, I'd like to quote, um, the response, quote a, a response from Children in Scotland to the Education and Culture Committee's call for, for written evidence when they said that acknowledging BSL and the strategic approach to the early years is a critical aspect of addressing the inequalities currently experienced by deaf children and young people, not least potentially having a positive impact on reducing the attainment gap. That attainment gap is, is all too evident here in Scotland when it comes to, to deaf pupils in terms of the amount of standard grades, hires, um, the amount of uh, deaf young people who go on to enter the jobs market, and I hope that this um, will be able to make a difference to that. Now, in my opinion, the Minister helpfully encapsulated the purpose of my bill when he said that the evidence session on the 17th of March 
Um, too often we talk about BSL users only as recipients of public services. As a country, we will benefit from their contribution if we protect, promote, support and value their language and culture. And to be honest, I um, couldn't have put it better myself, Minister, and that's why I use that, that quote today. I hope, I hope I haven't stolen your thunder in your speech. Um, but according to the last census, um, there are estimated to be more than 12,000 BSL users in Scotland, and some think that that figure may be suppressed because not all deaf BSL users um, use written English and so perhaps not able to complete the census form. Um, it's estimated that 120 children each year in Scotland are born with a, a hearing loss and as Mary Scanlon pointed out that the majority of those children being born are to hearing parents where the impact of that child being born with a hearing loss, um, the impact of that can be huge on parents, guardians, brothers and sisters, cousins and other family members um, who are hearing. A, a scoping study carried out by Marion Grimes in 2009 on behalf of the Scottish Sensory Centre in conjunction with the National Deaf Children's Society reported that only 8% of teachers could sign, and that means that other 92% couldn't sign then, raising the, the issue of how deaf children in Scotland are actually accessing their education. We need legislation which will encourage edu education providers to think about how deaf children can be educated and the language and the culture to which they belong. And I hope that one of the outcomes of the bill will be a greater uptake of the language and greater educational attainment of deaf pupils so that they are able to participate more fully in daily life. I think as things stand, we're all missing out on what deaf and deafblind people have, have to offer. Now, wouldn't it be fantastic if a BSL user could access health care or housing advice, whether they could report a, a crime in the, the police station, whether they could get advice from their local authority, if they could access that in their own language because the professional delivering that service was deaf or deafblind themselves. And that's why educational attainment is so critical. Data from um, the Deaf Achievement Scotland project shows that in 2010, the unemployment rate of young deaf people aged 16 to 24 was 49%, compared to 19% for all young people. I think we all have to, to do better than that, otherwise um, we really are missing out. Turning to the Education and Culture Committee's consideration of my bill, as, as part of the scrutiny of the bill, the committee set out to ensure that as many BSL users as possible were able to contribute by setting up a, a Facebook page. The use of digital media as an engagement tool is of particular importance to the deaf community as it allows people to post comments in video and text format and since the launch of that Facebook page back in December, I think well over 2,000, I think close to 2,500 people have joined and posted hundreds of comments, many in the form of, of BSL videos. And I'd like to thank the, the committee for their commitment to engage with members of the deaf community and giving them the means to be able to participate in a consultation process which is of so much importance to them. I'd also like to thank all of the people who responded to that consultation. The convener of the Education and Culture Committee himself acknowledged just how important the views of BSL users had been in enabling the committee to scrutinise the legislation. During the scrutiny um, of the bill, the committee were keen to pin down what exactly was meant by the term promotion of BSL, so I thought it would be helpful to try and clarify what it is I hope to achieve in relation to promotion of BSL. For me, promotion means approaching BSL as a language and not as a communication tool for the disabled. This means the language having a status equal to the Gaelic language and commanding the same kind of respect and appreciation of its long history and culture. 
We are all familiar to some extent with Gaelic because of dual language signposts with Gaelic appearing on many websites and I would like to see the same for, for BSL. I, I welcome the government's support for the bill. Like I said, I have been having a constructive dialogue with the Minister and officials and I look forward to seeing the detail of the amendments that the Minister had spoken about at committee. Presiding officer, I would like to thank everyone again for their contributions and consensual approach. I look forward to the debate and hearing from members to working with the committee, the minister and his officials to further refine the bill should it be supported today. And I'm pleased to move that the parliament agrees to the general principles of the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Stuart Maxwell to speak on behalf of the Education and Culture Committee. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Presiding Officer. Um, before I begin, can I add my congratulations to the Parliament uh, on the receipt of the award it's just received, uh, and also, before I start, to congratulate Mark Griffin for getting this far. It's a, I know what it's like trying to get a, a member's bill through the Parliament, uh, and, he, and he's done a great job in, in getting this far. I know it's a lot of hard work, so well done to Mark Griffin. Can I begin, President Officer, by saying I believe the fact that the committee unanimously supports the general principles of the bill reflects the value we as a parliament place on protecting Scotland's linguistic minorities. Before I talk about the committee's findings on the specifics of the bill, I want to say a bit about our approach to the bill and particularly our engagement with the BSL community. Throughout our scrutiny of the bill, we sought to engage directly with BSL users and the wider deaf and deafblind community. We wanted to understand the challenges experienced by people whose first language is BSL, to discuss the importance and benefits of using BSL, and consider what impact the BSL bill might have on their lives. We visited Windsor Park School and Sensory Service in Falkirk, where we met deaf pupils who attended the secondary school. The pupils told us that BSL was, an important, was important in helping them communicate with their classmates and their friends, which helped them to feel included and involved. We also met members of the Sensory Services team based in the Fourth Valley Sensory Centre and discussed some of the challenges around the provision of education for deaf pupils. Dennis Robertson. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, the member is aware that we have a signer today in the Parliament, and I'm just wondering if the member um, can perhaps slow down slightly in some of his address in order that the interpreter can keep up. Stuart Maxwell. Well, uh, I, I am duly chastised by Dennis Robertson for my, the speed of my speaking. Um, the, ba the balance I'm trying to strike is getting through all of that I'm trying to say today, uh, and hopefully the, the signers can keep up. Um, in Edinburgh, we held an open meeting at Deaf Action, where we discussed the bill with adult BSL users. There was enthusiastic support for the bill, even although it is seen as a stepping stone in a long-term project to improve access to services for BSL users. To enable people to share their views in BSL, we set up a Facebook group. This provided an easy way for people to communicate by posting BSL video clips. The group has attracted over 2,300 members and been shown to be a good example of how public bodies can be inclusive and accessible for deaf people. Throughout our work, we published key documents in BSL and our evidence sessions were broadcast with live BSL interpretation. The views of the deaf community have been extremely valuable in helping us understand the context of the bill and we are grateful to everyone who submitted views and evidence to us. Now turning to the committee's findings. Firstly, I'm grateful to the minister for his response to our report, which he has helpfully provided in time for this debate. While everyone who gave evidence to us agreed with the aim of the bill, to raise the profile of BSL, there were some different views about whether the bill was the best way to achieve it. Indeed, some public authorities told us they felt existing legislation was sufficient and indeed opposed the bill. Most cited the Equality Act 2010, which provides protection for people with certain characteristics, <laughs> including a disability, as the appropriate mechanism for addressing the communication needs of deaf people. It was suggested BSL users were already protected under the Equality Act as employers and service providers have an obligation to anticipate the needs of employees and service users and to make reasonable adjustments for them. Now, we explored this viewpoint in detail during our open meeting at Deaf Action and in our discussions with witnesses. From those discussions, it became clear to us that the bill is about promoting BSL as a minority language. 
That is an entirely different approach from using legislation that protects deaf people based on the view that they are disabled. The British Deaf Association put it very succinctly. The Equality Act accords rights to individuals to protect them from discrimination, but it does not protect or promote BSL as a language. The bill is an important step in helping to meet the linguistic needs of BSL users, in the same way as previous legislation did for the Gaelic language in Scotland. This is distinct from the protection offered by existing equality legislation, which identifies BSL users as disabled. During our scrutiny process, we were also acutely aware that the bill does not impose obligations on service providers or confer rights on BSL users. Therefore, we were very keen to find out whether the BSL community felt the bill went far enough. The clear message that came back was that the bill was a positive first step to improving services for BSL users. Presiding officer, the preparation of BSL plans is the primary means by which the bill, the bill seeks to promote BSL. Therefore, these plans are crucial to the delivery of the bill's objectives. From the views we received, there was general agreement that the planning framework proposed in the bill with the Scottish Government's national plan sets out priorities that inform and guide the lower level authority plans is a sensible and strategic model. For the committee, the most important thing is whether the BSL plans deliver the improvements that the bill aims to achieve, to heighten the profile of BSL and increase its use in the delivery of services. Of course, the quality of the national plan will be crucial in this respect, as it will set the tone for the authorities' plans. Now, as I mentioned earlier, we received lots of views and comments about the bill via Facebook and during our informal discussions. BSL users told us about the challenges experienced by deaf people when accessing services and called for BSL plans to address the following key priorities. Firstly, the promotion of BSL in an education setting. Secondly, improving access to health care and social care for BSL users. Thirdly, improving employment opportunities for BSL users. Providing early year support for deaf children and their families. Enabling the inclusion of BSL users in cultural and leisure activities. And finally, recognising the particular communication needs of deaf blind people and ensuring their interests are taken into account. Now, if the bill is passed today, then the Scottish Government and public authorities must ensure their plans are meaningful and reflect the needs of the BSL community. Effective engagement and consultation with BSL users will be crucial to the development of meaningful plans, and we strongly agree with the view that the bill should require BSL plans to be made available in BSL. It is frankly inconceivable that plans would not be made available in BSL. And I note the Scottish Government's view that the cost of translating BSL plans would now be classed as an additional cost of the bill rather than being subsumed under the existing equality duties as had been previously suggested. We also welcome the Scottish Government's proposal to establish an advisory group that will provide advice to Scottish ministers. As the national plan will set the framework for action on BSL, the advisory group will have a key responsibility in ensuring the bill is implemented and it, and it meets the needs of BSL users. It will be important to ensure that membership of the advisory group reflects the interests of the BSL community and support the Minister's commitment to ensure that BSL users, including deaf-blind BSL users, are represented on the group. Their expertise and their knowledge will be vital in ensuring the advisory group provides effective advice and guidance to Ministers. In addition, we have suggested in our report that the group's expertise could be of assistance to a wide range of public bodies, not just the Scottish Government, and we would be keen for it to act as a resource available to all listed authorities under the Bill. Uh, we very much welcome the suggestion from the Minister that this will indeed be the case and that the advisory group will provide guidance on the style and the content of authority plans. The committee supports the proposal to extend the scope of the national plan to include public authorities with a national function, which are accountable to the Scottish ministers. We recognise this will lead to fewer plans being produced and reduced bureaucracy. In our report, we cautioned that incorporating the plans into a single national plan must not dilute public authorities' accountability for delivering the actions included in the plan. I note the Minister's comments, however, that, in his view, this approach would strengthen the level of accountability and not dilute it. The important thing for the committee is whether the bill will help to deliver improvements for BSL users. In addition to introducing BSL plans, the bill proposes a performance review that is to be carried out by the Scottish Government and laid before the Parliament. 
The Bill proposes that the performance review will provide a basis for the Scottish Ministers and listed authorities to be held to account on their performance against the actions in their published plans. The review element is therefore central to the success of the Bill. The information provided by listed authorities in their plans will be used to judge performance. However, as the first cycle of plans will not include such information, this will not take effect until the second performance review and beyond. And as the Minister has usefully indicated in, in his response to our report, an alternative approach to collecting information during the first cycle to inform the first performance review will need to be developed. The Scottish Government has also suggested moving away from what the Bill describes as a performance review to what would instead be called a progress report. Now, part of the reason behind this is the concern raised by COSLA that it would be inappropriate for the Scottish Ministers to assess local authorities' performance as it, and I want to quote this, suggests a top-down command and control relationship between the Scottish Government and local authorities rather than the partnership relationship which currently exists. Now, while the committee understands COSLA's concerns, we did not arrive at a final position on the Scottish Government's proposal and asked for further clarity about how the progress report would operate. We look forward to receiving updates from the Minister on this, which we will consider in the context of any amendments that are lodged at Stage 2. In relation to the cycle for publishing BSL plans and performance reviews, the Bill suggests that this should be done every parliamentary session. As a result, there are some fairly complex arrangements that take account of, for example, the early dissolution of the Parliament. We therefore agree with the Scottish Government that there would be merit in simplifying the process by decoupling the publication cycle from the parliamentary timetable. However, we did not arrive at a conclusion on what length the new cycle should be. Some people suggested to us that five years was too short, while others were concerned that extending the cycle any further could mean the loss of more educational opportunities for deaf children. I know the Minister is now proposing a cycle of six years, which we will consider at stage two. However, we accept there would be benefits in allowing a longer lead-in time for the publication of the first national plan that is provided for in the Bill. An extended timetable would allow for the BSL National Advisory Group to be established, and I think it's likely that the Committee would support such an amendment to the Bill. We recognise, along with the Government, that the Bill could give rise to further cost implications, such as in relation to implementing the plans. While there, while there are likely to be additional costs, in my view, that is not a reason to oppose legislation that seeks to support the communication needs of the BSL community. I know the Minister has expressed a similar opinion. There is one other issue included in the report that I want to briefly mention. The Bill includes provision for a Minister to be appointed with special responsibility for BSL. We, however, are content with the Scottish Government's suggestion of removing this requirement from the Bill on the basis of Minister's collective responsibility on the understanding that BSL sits within a ministerial portfolio. In conclusion, Presiding Officer, the Committee supports the general principles of the Bill and recommends the Parliament agrees to them. It is clear further work is going on behind the scenes to give effect to some of the proposed changes that Mark Griffin and I have highlighted and any the Minister may mention in his contribution. The Committee welcomes the fact that the Scottish Government and indeed the member in charge have shown willingness to work together to develop this Bill and we look forward to considering any amendments that are brought forward at Stage 2. Thank you, Convener. And I now call on Dr Alistair Allen, Minister. Ten minutes, please. Thank you, Presiding Officer. And as others have done, uh, I would like to start by congratulating Mark Griffin for proposing this bill and for the uh, very positive approach he has taken to its development. And I would also like to place on record uh, my own thanks to Cathy Craigie for her early work, which helped to bring this bill to fruition. Presiding officer, um, it is important to acknowledge that the bill has huge support from MSPs from across the political parties and I believe from the BSL community who responded to the consultation and to the Education and Culture Committee's call for evidence in vast numbers. I'd like to take the opportunity to pay tribute to the committee for the way it has engaged with the BSL community as part of its scrutiny of the bill. This has included setting up a BSL bill Facebook group, which I believe has more than 2,000 members, and accepting BSL clips submitted via the Facebook page as evidence. This has ensured that the process for stage one of the bill has been both accessible and engaging to uh, the citizens of their country 
who use BSL. The Scottish Parliament has been applauded, as we've heard, uh, for the approach it has taken, and rightly so, and I would like to add my congratulations and thanks to the committee convener, Stuart Maxwell, deputy convener, Siobhan McMahon, and all the members for their detailed and careful consideration of this bill. As members will be aware, the Scottish Government fully supports the BSL Scotland Bill, and we've suggested some changes which we think will improve it, and which I think broadly uh, Mark Griffin has accepted. And I'll describe the main changes in just a minute. But first, I think it is important for me to say clearly that the Scottish Government recognises the cultural aspect of deafness and recognises British Sign Language as a language. We formalised this in a statement of recognition in 2011. Now, I had the opportunity to meet with a number of deaf and deaf-blind BSL users last week. And they described the marginalisation and exclusion that they face on a daily basis because they do not have linguistic access to information, services, opportunities, benefits, things that most of us take for granted. Profoundly deaf people who use BSL are covered, as we've heard, by equality legislation and human rights conventions which define them as having disabilities. But the evidence suggests that despite these legal protections, their needs are still not being met. Although there are examples of good practice to promote and support the use of BSL, there is a lot more that we can and must do across the Scottish public sector to address this. And I believe that this will benefit not only deaf BSL users, but all of Scotland. The changes that we have suggested to the bill will, I believe, reduce the bureaucratic burden on public bodies and make the legislation more action-orientated and outcome-focused. The most significant change we propose is that rather than all public bodies producing their own separate BSL plans, the national plan should cover all public bodies with a national remit who are directly accountable to Scottish ministers. I will, yes. Christine Graham. Thank you, Minister. That's very much to be welcome. But in my contribution, I want to ask you, so I'm preparing you for it, which in the list of public authorities, if any, on Schedule 2 would not be covered by your national plan? Dr Allen. Well, I'm glad you did prepare me for that. Uh, <coughs> uh, all, all I can really do is reiterate my point, which is that the... Our view is that the legislation in its schedule should outline uh, the bodies covered uh, and that they should all be covered by a national plan. If that doesn't answer the member's question, and I can sense by her face that it doesn't, I'm happy to, to speak to her afterwards about to that or correspond. But the other um, important uh, issues that I think uh, we can perhaps together seek improvements on is that we'd like to enable uh, a more coordinated strategic approach at a national level um, it will, I believe, significantly reduce the, the burdens uh, associated. We anticipate that the national plan will include general actions for all national public bodies, but it will also set out additional actions to be taken by specific national public bodies with responsibility for priorities included in the national plan. I've said in the government memorandum and in evidence to the committee that we intend to establish a BSL national advisory group which will have a crucial role in advising uh, Scottish ministers on the content of the plan. And importantly, the group will include a significant proportion of deaf BSL users, including deaf-blind BSL users and families of deaf children who use BSL. Effective engagement, when done properly, also plays a key role in ensuring that public bodies are accountable to the communities they serve. This is important for all public bodies, but particularly for local authorities who are not directly accountable to Scottish ministers. And so, like the committee, we agree that engagement with the BSL community will help to ensure that the bill delivers real improvements. Indeed, we feel that this will be a more appropriate and effective approach to supporting ongoing improvement than merely naming and shaming individual public bodies. We do agree that it will be important to review activity against plans on a regular basis 
through a progress, report, progress report informed by the National Advisory Group. We propose that this information should be collected through uh, a self-assessment exercise uh, and uh, uh, with feedback from BSL users. And on the subject of authority plans, members may be aware that the Scottish Government has previously suggested uh, that listed authorities should be required to publish BSL statements rather than plans, as we felt that these would be more streamlined and focused. However, on reflection, we do accept the Committee's view that in reality there is no legal difference between a statement and a plan, and we will instead focus uh, our efforts on using guidance to encourage listed authorities to ensure that their plans uh, are concise and action orientated. Presiding officer, I firmly believe that engaging effectively with the BSL community in the months and years ahead will be crucial to help ensure that across the public sector we focus on making the changes which will have a positive and lasting impact on the lives of the BSL community in Scotland. We have recently announced funding of £390,000 from the Equality Fund uh, to five deaf organisations to help make this happen. The organisations are British Deaf Association, Scottish Council on Deafness, uh, Deaf Action, Deaf Connections and Deaf Blind Scotland. So can I take this opportunity to thank these organisations for what I am sure will be an invaluable role in the successful early implementation of the Bill. In closing, it is my view that if we promote, protect, support and value British Sign Language and Deaf culture, we will all benefit from the greater contribution which our Deaf citizens can and want to make to our communities, our country and our economy. So, Presiding Officer, I look forward to what I hope will be a positive debate today about the benefits of supporting British Sign Language and the benefits of Mark Griffin's Bill. Many thanks, Minister. I now call on Siobhan McMahon. Ms McMahon, six minutes, please. Thank you, President Officer. It gives me great pleasure to open this debate for Scottish Labour this afternoon and to pledge your support to Mark Griffin's BSL Bill, particularly during Deaf Awareness Week, a week that we're now celebrating. I would at the outset like to thank Mark for proposing this extremely significant bill and congratulate him in not only bringing it to the Chamber today, but also for the way in which he has conducted himself throughout the, the bill's progress. I know that this hasn't been the easiest of journeys, but I'm sure it will be a worthwhile one. As a member of the Education and Cultural Committee, I have heard first-hand evidence as to why we require this bill and what impact it is likely to have on people's lives if it fulfils its potential. The policy intention of the bill is quite clear, that the profile of language will be heightened and its, and its use in the delivery of services increased. However, for many people, especially public bodies, they may see this bill as an equality issue based on disability. Many times during evidence, both verbal and written, witnesses referred to the Equality Act as a means of dismissing the proposed BSL bill. Some people believe that the Equality Act should be sufficient to deal with the provision of BSL. However, as Deaf Action said, many people are confused about what is covered under the Equality Act and do not consider deaf people to be disabled or covered by that Act. This bill is necessary as it is about a language and it is difficult to fit linguistic issues into legislation designed for disability. Many deaf people do not see themselves as disabled and it would be wrong for public bodies to implement decisions which in effect do not recognise this. As the Scottish Association of Sign Language Interpreters stated, BSL is a language, a culture and an identity. This point was further highlighted by the British Deaf Association Scotland, who told the committee that speakers of other Indigenous spoken languages are not required to self-identify as disabled to access their language rights. It is only right then that we treat deaf people as we would any other person wishing to put their language rights into law. Given that there are an estimated between 6,000 and 10,000 BSL users in Scotland and that 120 children each year are born with a severe or profound hearing loss, we have to start changing the way we think about deaf people in our society. It is not acceptable that there are only 80 interpreters for the deaf community in Scotland. That's one in 100 for every deaf person, whereas in Finland, 
A country already with a recognised sign language act, the figure is one in six. It is horrifying to learn that hearing parents are finding it difficult to communicate with their deaf children because the parents cannot get access to BSL classes. Given that 90 per cent of deaf children are born to hearing parents, this is a significant amount of people across Scotland. This bill could make sure that those parents would get the right help when they require it and that the barriers they are currently in place would be removed. Statistics from the Scottish Council on Deafness found that 77 per cent of BSL users who had visited hospital could not easily communicate with the NHS staff. This is a deeply concerning figure, given that we all want our health service to serve everyone in our society. It cannot be acceptable to find such a high number of people being unable to communicate with their health professionals at such a worrying time in their lives. This bill could change this statistic for the better if the policy intentions are delivered. Another topic that the Education Committee and the Scottish Government have been focusing on at the moment is the attainment gap. During evidence to the committee regarding the BSL bill, we found that the attainment gap for deaf learners was extremely worrying. Scottish Government figures for 2011-12 show that 36.4% of deaf pupils attained hires or advanced hires, compared to 60.2% of hearing pupils. Scottish Government data also shows that only 26% of deaf school leavers are likely to go on to higher education, compared to 39% of hearing school leavers. And as Mark Griffin said earlier, the Grimes report in 2009 indicated that only 8% of teachers of the deaf can sign. This is of major concern to many, and it's not something that can be addressed by this bill directly. Although being able to have access to communication from teachers and other educational professionals may be of some help to many, it's, it is something that must be addressed to the Scottish Government's current education bill, and I look forward to further discussion on this in the coming weeks and months. Mark Griffin has previously spoken of the current postcode service provision that currently exists for BSL users. In addition to this, Deaf Services Lanarkshire are very critical about current standards of care in their area. In their words, the provision to the deaf community is dismal. This bill would change that not only for the people of Lanarkshire, but for people throughout Scotland. I would echo the views of the committee when I say the performance review is critical to the success of this bill. It provides the mechanism for ensuring progress is made in delivering tangible improvements for BSL users. I would urge the Government to make sure that this particular aspect of the Bill is implemented correctly and with the full support of stakeholders. It has been made clear by Mark Griffin and organisations supporting this Bill that this proposed Bill is the first step on the journey to improve the lives of deaf people in Scotland. This Bill will not solve all the problems deaf people currently face, but it is an important first step and this Parliament must take it today. As we heard in evidence, this bill will give deaf people the opportunity to access life through their own language. There could be no stronger point to end on. I look forward to supporting this bill at decision time tonight. Many thanks. And I now call on Mary Scanlon. Six minutes, please. Uh, thank, thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to start by saying that Scottish Conservatives fully support uh, the BSL bill at this stage. And can I also, Presiding Officer, say that there's something... Uh, quite special about every party in this parliament actually agreeing on such a special bill to provide sign language for deaf people when we're all at loggerheads fighting battles across the streets of Scotland. But uh, I think that's politics uh, as we know it. Um, uh, I would also like to thank Mark Griffin for bringing forward this bill in British, British Sign Language. Uh, Mark not only has the best intentions for this bill, but he also has the best reasons uh, which he shared with the committee. Uh, no one said it, so I, I will say it. Mark watched his grandparents struggle uh, with the lack of British Sign Language provision and understanding, and he probably thought that two generations later that things would have improved quite considerably. And it is the comparison between what is available today and what Mark Griffin saw two generations ago that has uh, inspired this bill, and we should all welcome that and commend Mark Griffin for having the courage and the background for bringing that forward. I think it's also worth putting on record that Cathy Craigie, as others have mentioned, former Labour MSP, worked very hard on this issue. <coughs> Excuse me. And indeed, in this Parliament, Jenny Mara, to be fair, has also been a champion for improving services, training and understanding for the needs of deaf people. 
And while I'm giving my thanks, I would like to thank the Scottish Government for responding to the committee report at stage one. I do feel this is a critical part of parliamentary proceedings, given that some aspects of the bill have been dropped, such as the requirement uh, for a, a minister, that's already agreed, uh, or indeed proposed amendments due in stage two, which makes today a mark of progress with agreement and a full, open and transparent debate, not only from all parties today, but we've moved on with the response from the Law Society, Inclusion Scotland, National Deaf Children's Society, who have all sent in updated briefing papers in response to the committee report at stage one, but also in response to the government's uh, response to our committee report. Uh, I have to say that it was unfortunate the Minister for Mental Health was unable to do so at stage one, and I hope he's perhaps learned from the approach the government has taken to this bill, because it's certainly very, very helpful. The assurance from the Scottish Government that direct responsibility for the promotion of BSL is included in the ministerial portfolio is very welcome. And uh, I would like to think that this bill will succeed in heightening the profile of BSL and increase uh, its use in the delivery of services. However, I have to say at this stage, I'm not entirely confident that it will make a huge difference because we do need quite a bit more clarity on many parts of the bill. And if it is vague in any way at this stage, this can potentially mean that it could be vague in implementation. However, given the comparisons to Gaelic and the huge success in Gaelic speakers, Gaelic teachers and access to Gaelic language in recent years, if BSL at least makes some of this progress, then the bill will be deemed a success. I would also add, add that there's still much more to do on the Gaelic front. The main provision in the bill is the delivery of national and authority plans. And although we need to see more detail about the Scottish Government's suggestion for statements to be produced rather than plans, we also need clarity on the performance review which is critical to the success of the bill by providing the mechanism to ensure progress is made in delivering tangible improvements. And more clarity on what would be a progress report, because I appreciate that the intention of the bill is an important stepping stone in the development of BSL. Mark Griffin has quite often mentioned the different levels of provision throughout Scotland and it's been referred to as postcode service provision. Now, if that is looking for a consistent approach across Scotland, then I think that's something that we would all welcome. And then Inclusion Scotland asked for an honest appraisal of where the gaps in provision exist and how these will be addressed during the period of the plan. And I don't think this is an unreasonable request, but nonetheless, it's a huge amount of work. So whether it's a plan, a statement or a progress report, if we're looking for a consistent level of service, uh, then that, that, that is quite a considerable commitment. I am pleased that naming and shaming has been dropped. I think that carrots always work better as an incentive mechanism rather than sticks. Uh, but uh, I, I do feel that some authorities may be starting from a very low base of provision, so they may make tremendous progress, whereas others may start at a much higher base, a higher level of service, and not make much provision, much progress. So if we're looking for a consistent level of service, some are likely to make more progress than others. So I think we need to look... Do we want progress from everyone, even the ones that are doing it really, really well? So I would like some more clarity on that. And as I'm summing up, I'll raise the other issues I have then. Thank you. Many thanks. We now turn to the open debate. I would ask members who wish to participate to ensure the request to speak buttons are pressed, please. And it will be speeches of six minutes. Dennis Robertson to be followed by Margaret McCulloch. Thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Can I first of all thank Mark Griffin 
for uh, continuing to bring this bill before Parliament. As someone who had recently brought forward a member's bill uh, to Parliament, I understand the workload that is involved and indeed um, he has my sympathy to some extent. But this is an important bill, presiding officer. And can I welcome those in the gallery who are here today, those BSL users who are here today, because they are here because they want to ensure that their BSL is seen as a language, not a disability. Presiding officer, it is important that we have that distinction. As someone who grew up not really having an aptitude for language at school, my Latin teacher said to me, boy, my name was Dennis, but he called me boy. My name still is Dennis, of course, presiding officer. Um, but he said, you haven't got a grasp of grammar. You will therefore never get an acquirement of Latin. And as a Doric loon from Aberdeen, I always thought my grammar was married to my grandfather. That was the problem I had with my aptitude of language. But presiding officer, I know very little in the way of French. I know very little in the way of Spanish. I know very little BSL. And why is that? It's because quite often we assume that others will speak our language or language of English. BSL users are not wanting to speak to one another or only be able to speak to one another. They want to be understood when they go into a public service or any other service, presiding officer. They want to be understood in order that they can acquire the same rights as anyone else, the same respect as anyone else, because it is a language and not a disability. It has been said and we, <laughs> that society is finding it difficult to find the difference between this language and disability. So bringing this bill forward is something that we should ensure sees the passage of Parliament to stage three. It does require slight amendments. Mark Griffin acknowledges that. But it requires and has done since its inception the input from those using BSL. Mark has listened. Mark has engaged. And I know this because as the deputy convener of the cross-party indefinites, I have listened also to the other groups coming in to Parliament to engage with Mark. Consultation is important, but consultation in itself means nothing unless you move forward with actions, because actions do speak louder than words. And that takes me to the award received today in Parliament, Louder Than Words, an award presented by Delia Henry, the Chief Executive for Action on Hearing Loss to this Parliament. And that was achieved not by tick boxing, it was achieved because this Parliament is leading the way in accessibility and leading the way in trying to ensure that deaf, deaf-blind people and those of hard of hearing have the access to the information within this parliament. And this is where we should also congratulate, congratulate Anila McKenna, our Equalities Manager in Parliament. Presiding Officer, I had the privilege in my last job of working with people who are deaf, deaf-blind, hard of hearing, blind, and partially sighted. In fact, they were considered a group of people 
with sensory impairments. And one of the things I had the, the privilege of doing was ensuring that staff, all staff, reception staff, social workers, support workers, volunteers, had an awareness of the BSL. Stage one, and for many, they went on to stage two. In order that they could engage with those who used BSL that were coming in for that service. And what was remarkable, presiding officer, was the way in which the staff who had no knowledge of BSL in the initial stages took to that language. They took to that language in a way that I hadn't done in my school days. But they took to it in a way that they were able to see the benefit of using that language. They engaged with people and they saw the awareness and sometimes the gratitude of people who are using BSL or who are reliant on BSL. Mark Griffin is taking this bill forward for people using BSL. But it's not just for the deaf community, presiding officer. It is for society. Society are needing to be aware of and needing to learn B. S L as a language. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call in Margaret McCullough to be followed by Gordon MacDonald. Thank you, President Officer. I welcome this opportunity also to speak this afternoon on the, Br the British Sign Language Bill. In requiring government and public authorities to put in place BSL plans, this bill could help develop an infrastructure and services to support British Sign Language and it delivers a fairer deal for the people who use BSL to communicate. The proposals contained within this bill are right in principle, and on that basis, I hope it proceeds. I believe that this bill has potential to improve the quality of life for a significant linguistic minority in our society. I believe this bill not only helps to promote awareness of British Sign Language and the needs of those who use it, but encourages accessible government, active and inclusive citizenship and the growth of the culture surrounding this rich and wonderful language. I therefore also pay tribute to Mark Griffin for introducing this bill and securing support from members across the chamber. I also want to congratulate all those BSL users and champions of the language who have campaigned for change. I know in the last Parliament a member's bill on British Sign Language was proposed by Cathy Craigie, but it fell when the Parliament was adjourned. I realise the proposals before us now are not identical, but it is clear to me that many deaf people and BSL users are still not satisfied with the status quo and continue to demand change. We are only debating this bill today because of the conviction and the persistence of those who have been steadfast in their belief that a new law would help protect and promote this language. For them and for those they represent, I hope we can agree on the principles behind Mark Griffin's bill and move a step closer to legislative change. Presiding officer, this bill requires Scottish ministers to facilitate the promotion of BSL through a national plan for the language and it requires the authorities listed in Schedule 2 of the Bill to develop their own plans too. This is not simply a bureaucratic exercise. This is a means of focusing minds in government at all levels on meeting the needs of those who use BSL. Working with BSL users, government and public authorities will have to consider how they use BSL in the delivery of services and how they develop the language. The bill is not overly prescriptive. It does not require BSL to be a modern language in schools. For example, it does not require teachers to have a BSL qualification. However, the bill is crafted in such a way that these kind of initiatives could be included in BSL plans, and these plans would, of course, be subject to performance review. What this bill does seek to do is to put BSL on an equal footing with Gaelic another rich and wonderful language, which has a measure of protection in Scottish law. Presiding officer, I know that we are not approaching this issue principally as an equalities issue. 
This is about a language used by a linguistic minority being more widely understood and promoted. Let's be clear about the importance of the Equality Act for people with disabilities and people who are deaf. Our equality legislation is to be valued. However, I would also draw the Chamber's attention to the consultation submissions from the Deaf Association in Scotland. They say, currently language rights for BSL are only offered under ages of disability legislation. However, however speakers of other Indigenous spoken languages are not required to self-identify as disabled to access, access their language rights. The Quality Act 2010 does not make specific reference to BSL and it is therefore the subject of case law. They go on to say that the Quality Act accords rights to individuals to protect them from discrimination, but it does not protect or promote BSL as a language. I believe there is therefore a gap in legislation which this bill addresses. Article 3 of the Universal Declaration of Linguistic Rights confers on any members of a linguistic community the right to use their own language and to be taught or to receive information in that language. And Article 5 asserts that the rights of all language communities are equal. This bill would be in keeping with the spirit of that declaration. It would sit alongside equality legislation, not in place of it. It would provide a platform in which we can build the further growth and greater development of British Sign Language. Presiding Officer, I am obviously aware that the needs of those who are deaf or affected by hearing loss are not identical. Deaf-blind people, for example, who are registered blind, cannot make use of a visual language. Their needs are different. They would typically use a tactile British Sign Language or deaf-blind manual variations on BSL. Meeting these needs can be more resource intensive because it requires one-to-one -one communication. In the past, when improvements for BSL users have been achieved, these have not necessarily benefit, benefited deafblind people in full. However, I think it is important to note that Deafblind Scotland supports the BSL Bill. They recognise that this bill will improve the experiences of deaf people. I also believe there is scope within the bill I'm actually really tight for time, thank you. I also believe there is scope within the bill to address the needs of deafblind people too. I see from evidence received by the Education Committee that some respondents to their call for evidence were concerned that a focus on British Sign Language could detract from other methods of communication used by deaf people and those who have experienced hearing loss. For example, Deaf Action have highlighted the use of lip speaking and the need to continue to train and recruit, recruit skilled note takers. However, Deaf Action are also supportive, supportive of this bill, as are most, most organisations which advocate for deaf people. None of the concerns that have been expressed strike me as a barrier to this bill progressing. Indeed, I can see from the Education and Culture Committee's report that the Member and the Government have been commended for their collaborative approach to this Bill. Continuing in that spirit, I am sure that Mark Griffin will be able to deliver a Bill which carries broad support within the Chamber and outside too. Finally, President Officer, the Scottish Council on Deafness described this Bill as a, promo as a promoting and enabling catalyst. I agree with them. This bill can help us secure broader recognition of BSL and it can substantially improve the lives of people who use this wonderful language. Let us allow this bill to progress and give BSL the status and the support it deserves. Thank you. Thank you. And I call Gordon MacDonald to be followed by Liam MacArthur. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I welcome the opportunity to speak on the British Sign, Sign Language Bill and as a member of the Education and Culture Committee, I have had the opportunity to consider the proposals contained in this bill. And can I congratulate Mark Griffin on the progress of the bill to date. And I also thank uh, Deaf Action for arranging a visit to their offices in Edinburgh to meet members of the deaf community. I found that very helpful in understanding everyday issues facing BSL users. Presiding officer, there are estimated to be around 6,500 people who depend on sign language and around 850,000 people with some form of hearing loss in Scotland. 
With this in mind, it is important to note, and as the Minister has already stated, that the Scottish Government recognised deafness as a culture and formally recognised BSL as a language back in 2011. However, four years later, deaf people are still facing problems in their daily life that most people take for granted. Many deaf people who contributed evidence via the Facebook page highlighted the barriers that had stopped them from accessing basic services as a result of sign language not being widely used, whether it was in education, health, banking, policing, or a whole range of other services, many felt that the lack of BSL interpreters or people who could sign had limited their access to those basic services and left them feeling isolated. They all expressed a hope that the bill would resolve some of these issues by raising awareness of the needs of deaf people. The policy memorandum to the bill highlights that it aims to promote the use and understanding of British Sign Language principally by means of BSL plans, which are to be published by Scottish ministers and specified public authorities. However, the SPICE briefing outlined that the bill does not confer on BSL users any rights or impose service obligations on authorities. As such, the bill is not directed about the needs of BSL users, nor is it about the needs of a wider group of people with hearing impairments. As I said earlier, the Scottish Government recognised BS BSL as a language four years ago, and through its work with the BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group, published a detailed report back in 2009, The Long and Winding Road, a roadmap to British Sign Language and lingu Linguistic Access in Scotland. It has already taken steps to promote and support BSL through a number of activities, including funding to support the teaching and learning of BSL, encouraging schools to offer BSL as a subject alongside other modern languages, and provided funding to develop a pilot online interpreting project for BSL users wishing to access public services by phone. Yeah, sure. Dennis Roberts. I'm sorry, Mr Robertson, can I stop you a moment? We don't have your microphone. We do now. Thank you. Mr Robertson's microphone, please. Uh, thank you for taking the brief intervention. The member agree with me that, as well as schools, uh, that we should be encouraging maybe youth groups like Scouts, Guides uh, and other such groups to maybe perhaps learn uh, to take BSL as a subject in order that they can communicate with people using BSL. Gordon MacDonald. Yeah, I absolutely agree. And as um, my son is a scout leader with the Blind Scout Group in, in Edinburgh, I fully support anything that widens access to supporting people in dis uh, with disabilities of some description. Um, through these activities, the Scottish Government has increased the profile of BSL, increased the number of interpreters and of deaf tutors able to teach BSL at a higher level and developed a better understanding of the language. However, despite all of this, BSL users are still facing difficulties in accessing public services today. The difference that this bill could make is that it will encourage and enable the Scottish Government, key public authorities and the deaf community to promote and support BSL, agree national priorities and set out the specific measurable actions they will take to make progress towards these priorities. Given that there are 117 public bodies across Scotland that would be required to produce a BSL plan, then it would be sensible if authorities working in the same geographic area could explore the opportunities for joint working and to reflect these in their initial set of actions. This would reduce the burden on cost on public authorities and create the possibility for more shared expertise and resources. The financial issue is especially important in the current economic climate and in light of the estimates for producing the initial plans for all public authorities is in the region of 2.4 to 3.6 million. What we don't want to happen is that money currently spent providing services to the BSL community and people with hearing difficulties being redirected to produce a plan. These plans will only be meaningful if there is an effective review of the implementation of the plans with resultant action points. Presiding officer, uh, I support the aims of this bill to promote BSL, but we have to recognise there are many countries across the world 
from Norway to New Zealand and Greece to Venezuela, who have already formalised recognition of their Indigenous sign language within their legal structures. On that note, I will leave the last word to Deaf Action Scotland, who in their written evidence concluded, we believe that the BSL Bill will have a positive impact because it will allow us to move a step closer to BSL language being more widely endorsed within society. Although the Bill is primarily concerned with the promotion of BSL and does not impose obligations on service providers or confer rights on BSL users, it does place a duty on 117 public authorities to prepare a BSL authority plan that set out the measures to be undertaken by each authority in relation to the use of BSL and to establish timescales on their achievement. It may not be the bill that we could have hoped and campaigned for. Nevertheless, it represents progress, and this has to be welcomed. Thank you. I now call Liam MacArthur to be followed by Stuart Stevenson. Uh, thank you, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I start, um, like the convener did, in thanking all those that helped us uh, prepare our Stage 1 uh, report? In particular, thank uh, those who gave evidence, and um, particularly those from the BSL user and deaf uh, community. As a number of people ob observed, they engaged enthusiastically and in high numbers. I can't recall uh, an occasion where meetings of the Education Committee were almost standing room only, uh, but that was achieved at various points during our consideration of the evidence. Can I thank, like Gordon MacDonald, those who hosted our visits, notably the Golden Amber Club, um, Deaf Actions uh, Golden Amber Club, and the staff and pupils at Windsor Park School. Those visits were invaluable in terms of giving us uh, all an insight into the issues underpinning this bill. And uh, finally, can I congratulate uh, Mark Griffin on his work, uh, his work with the BSL community in delivering uh, their aspirations, but also his work with the committee and with the minister and his officials uh, in ensuring that that change is in fact uh, achieved. I confess that I went into this process, uh, I think, fixated with the issues around access, some of the issues Siobhan McMahon related in, in terms of um, the uh, attainment levels in education, uh, some of the barriers to, to employment. Uh, but it very quickly became apparent that the bill here was, was seeking to achieve something uh, wider than, than, than that, uh, that it was not simply a question of providing communication support to deaf people, that supporters of the bill focused on the need to increase recognition of BSL as an Indigenous language with its own cultures. And I think, understandably, the parallels have been drawn uh, with Gaelic. Uh, and I think it's right that the committee, in, it, in its report, uh, has said that, like Gaelic speakers, deaf people have their culture and identity and should be able to access information and services in their first language. And that's not uh, in any way exclusive. It's very inclusive, in fact. I think that um, some examples have been given in relation to, to parents of, of, of deaf children. Um, I, I was very struck by the visit to Windsor Park School, where the pupils were talking about uh, the desire amongst their uh, hearing peers uh, to learn BSL so as to be able to communicate in the way that all children look to do. But despite the consensus that exists, it's not by any means universal. Uh, concerns were raised in terms of whether or not this was already covered by the uh, equality legislation. And I think not only is there patchiness in the way that that's being applied, but actually it misses the point about the fact that the, that the equality legislation will do nothing uh, for promoting BSL as a standalone uh, language. There were concerns too that the rise in expectations may lead to cost pressures in terms of expanding uh, services. And I think we may need to keep a weather eye on that. But nevertheless, I think the uh, BSL community themselves have been very pragmatic about what this bill will achieve. We were concerned as a committee that it may raise expectations on Julie. I think that concern was put to rest fairly early on. That the BSL community have a clearer idea of what this bill does and indeed what it doesn't do than perhaps many of us that were considering it uh, did at the outset. In terms of the bill itself, um, obviously the national and authority plans uh, lie at the, the, the centre of it. And I, I think I was encouraged by the Scottish Government's statement uh, in its evidence that these would provide momentum, coordination and focus across the public sector to improve BSL's users' access to public services and to enable them to participate fully and equally in daily 
and public life. I think the content of uh, those plans still to be fleshed out, but the input we've already had from BSL users, I think, shows us uh, the way those need to go. We need to um, uh, prioritise the promotion of BSL in an education setting, including in early years support, improving access to healthcare, improving employment opportunities, and recognising, as Mark Griffin did in his remarks, the particular and very distinct needs of the deafblind uh, community. There was understandably concern to avoid um, an overly bureaucratic process to delivering uh, those sensible proposals. And I think that the, the Minister's come forward with uh, amendments that may help uh, achieve that in terms of uh, authority statements rather than plans, uh, having a national plan covering authorities uh, answerable to the Scottish Government. These make sense and, uh, and are a pragmatic response, but only um, if there is the sufficient level of relevant detail in those plans and that each authority is accountable for the aspects of it that relate to their uh, work. And I think, as the convener says, it's inconceivable that those are not available uh, in BSL. There's a vital role uh, in both respects for the advisory group and indeed for Parliament in ensuring uh, that we hold that to account. And I think also a further argument for why the uh, majority of members of that advisory group need to themselves be drawn from the BSL uh, community. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, in, in conclusion, I think there will be those who worry that this bill raises expectations on Julie. Uh, there will be others who are concerned that it does not go uh, far enough. But uh, as we all know, politics is about the art of the possible. And I think from the evidence that we have received, uh, Mark Griffin is to be congratulated on having strike, uh, struck a, a good balance about what can be achieved now. And I think it lays the groundwork uh, for future advances uh, in the years ahead. This bill can and will, I believe, help raise the profile of BSL as a distinct language and increase its use in the delivery of services. That's not a bad achievement, Deputy Presiding Officer, and I look forward to working with my committee colleagues, uh, with the Minister and, of course, with Mark Griffin himself, to make the improvements necessary at Stage 2 and Stage 3 in the interests of all those in the BSL and deaf community in Scotland. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call Stuart Stevenson to be followed by Nigel Dawn. Uh, presiding officer, this debate is uh, less than uh, half over, uh, and yet I already find myself personally significantly challenged by this, and with a whole series of questions I have to go away and ask myself after the debate, because it has been informative. Um, I, I, th I think there's some doubt in some things. Siobhan McMahon said there's a hundred BSL speakers for each of the 80 interpreters it might actually be even worse than that because the 2011 census, according to Spice, tells us there's 12,533 households where someone speaks BSL, which would make it uh, one interpreter for every 150 houses where BSL is spoken. So whichever number it is, whatever number is relevant, it's clearly a challenging and important uh, issue uh, that we find ourselves uh, properly uh, debating today. Now, of course, using visual communication is not something which, for any of us, is alien. A shrug of the shoulders is immediately recognised as doubt. Um, the fingers like that is money, and this is do you want a drink? So we all have our little bits of personal sign language, but, of course, BSL is quite different because what it is is a standardised approach that reaches beyond local variation and culture. But, of course, uh, it's equally a language uh, uh, which, uh, when people are speaking to each other in a social setting, has slang and has rude words, genuinely is as rich uh, as any other language. Now, we had some suggestion that perhaps the list of bodies that are affected by this um, ought to be looked at. It does strike me that some of these bodies, the use of sign language or any language, has legal force. If you're in the court, if you're before a tribunal, it's important there's precision. So therefore, you have a particular need that needs to be emphasised in that environment. But in social environments, in normal day-to-day -day commerce, perhaps there is less rigour required. Uh, so we need to make sure that where legal force is required, we have people in place. And I hope the plans that are brought forward... Yes, I will. Dan Robertson. I'm grateful to the member for taking an intervention. Can I advise the member that the BSL community themselves 
um, can usually tell which part of Scotland or any other part of Britain where someone comes from because of the, the differences in using the, the language. Uh, I was taught uh, BSL from um, someone from Glasgow and he had to vary the, 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 the teaching to take in some of the language differences in Aberdeen. And as it is a visual language, I could present, but I could not receive. Stuart Stevenson. Um, I look forward to hearing the difference between Doric BSL and posh Morningside BSL, perhaps uh, uh, after, after the, uh, the, the debate here. Um, I have one or two things that, that sort of have come to me as the debate has developed and as I thought about uh, what I might say. Uh, for example, um, is there a standardised sign that we ought to see as part of our future planning saying BSL spoken here? So that people who, whose first language and preferred language is BSL know where to go. Uh, and it should be a very simple symbol, by the way, um, so that if you're driving a car, you can see the symbol in a glance. Uh, the letters BSL might be good enough if they're in a standard format. Um, there's a lot of academic research has been done. Desmond Morris produced a, a wonderful book uh, called Man Watching, which was essentially about we, how we communicate uh, visually. Uh, and I commend that, uh, commend that to others. I, in my journeys to Parliament here, regularly see uh, sign languages. And indeed, I've been watching uh, BSL conversations in the public gallery which have not attracted the ire of the presiding officer because they're not intruding as uh, an oral conversation might do um, into the, the, the performance here. People who are visually impaired have huge help and we can see it. The edge of platforms at railway stations have bobbles so you know you're reaching them. The same on uh, pavement markings. Uh, buses and trains have oral announcements that help the blind. How much are we doing for people who are deaf? So much less. So I think it is absolutely important uh, that we look at this as something where there is a category of people in our community, of people with a particular language, who have been significantly neglected uh, compared uh, to others. When I was a youngster in our uh, Sunday school, we actually uh, were taught some BSL. At least I think it was BSL, certainly sign language of some kind. Alas, not a shred of that uh, survives into my adult life. Even simple things like Dennis said, we need to be careful about our speaking rate. Well, over the nearly half million words I've contributed to parliamentary debates uh, since I came here in 2001, I'm averaging 131 words a minute. Do I really need to slow down? Can I speed up? And of course, as Dennis, in a little aside, uh, a minute or two ago explained to me, there isn't an exact map of words between the languages. Um, he told me that, for example, BSL doesn't have a word for if. Well, that's actually quite, uh, quite good news, because if's one of the most destructive words uh, in the English language in, in, in certain contexts. Let me just close, presiding officer, by saying a word or two about the efforts of the uh, proposal that is Bill Mark Griffin and uh, congratulate him on his work. We as a, a parliament should always be looking at what other parliaments uh, do. Australia has a seven-minute curfew on questions at Prime Minister's question time. It doesn't matter if the Minister, First Minister, Prime Minister is speaking, chop, next question. Not a bad idea. We're looking at what Westminster have done in electing committee conveners. But I think what we do and can show others is the access there is for backbenchers to their being able to legislate. Uh, in fact, if every uh, backbencher took the opportunity, that would be 256 bills per parliamentary session. But of course, there are so many fewer because it's a formidably difficult task, engaging a lot of time and effort. And I absolutely want to congratulate Mark uh, Griffiths on the work he's put into this and thank him uh, for that, if only for raising my awareness and giving me a set of questions I have to go and ask myself and get answers to later, presiding officer. Thank you. Could I remind members to use full names when they refer to each other, please? Nigel Dawn to be followed by Jane Baxter. Thank you very much, uh, presiding officer. I would like to start congratu by congratulating Mark Griffin. Others have explained the process and they've been through it. I haven't, 
I'm not expecting to, to be honest, because I've realized it's actually quite difficult. But I think history is actually going to tell us that this was an important day, because I think this bill is going to be seen 10, 20 years' time as the first step of quite a number of steps that are going to get one of Scotland's languages into a place where it should have been for a very long time. And uh, as has already been said, I think by Liam MacArthur, this is the practicable step at this stage. But I'm very clear it is no more than a step. And if anybody thinks this is where we stop, then I think we need to say to them now, no, you're wrong. I've actually met BSL translation in several places uh, in, in my political career. But I have to say one of the most interesting ones was only a few weeks ago when we looked at this very bill in the Delegated Powers and Law Reform Committee, which others will remember. And it taught me two things. The first is that you need to speak slowly because translation is one of those arts. If you're going to get the real sense of what's being said, then you've got to be able to think about it. Clearly, translators and interpreters are extremely bright folk, but there is a limit to the rate at which this can be dealt with and the right gestures put forward. The second thing it taught me is that you need to keep your voice up. And a lot of us, and I am one of them, tend to drop our voices at the end of the sentence, at the end of the sentence, and you don't know what they said. So that's a lesson in public speaking for all of us. Use BSL translators and you learn to speak up. There's also one other thing that's emerged this afternoon, and I'd like to dwell on it for just a moment, presiding officer, and that was the influence of Cathy Craigie. Because, as has rightly been pointed out, Cathy Craigie was significantly involved in a piece of legislation or a draft bill on this in the previous session. She was significantly involved in the cross-party group on deafness, as it may come as news to some, was I in session three. And I think the lesson that I derive from this is actually to see how important cross-party groups can be in engaging with a part of Scottish society discovering what needs to be done, and then over time getting that through the legislative process. I do also reflect that it has taken quite some time, and I think maybe that's just the reality, but it does suggest to us that we need to persevere. An aspect of BSL use that I think we have not said very much about this afternoon is the issue of the marginalisation and the isolation of BSL users. Because I think what we will know from a few moments' reflection is that when you feel marginalized and isolated, that is a mental health issue. And people who want to use a language which the rest of society is not prepared to let them use are immediately being given a mental health issue, never mind a communication issue. And I'm pleased to note that in the government's response, there does seem to be a recognition that the costs of this bill and the implementation of it will probably, to some extent at least, come back in the reduction in some of the health costs that we might otherwise be building up for ourselves. And I think that's important. We need to understand that eliminating inequalities at every level within our society does actually have economic benefits to the public purse. It's good for absolutely everybody. If I can turn now briefly to the national plan, it's been suggested that we might take a bit longer to get this right. Can I say I must absolutely endorse that? It does seem to me that the first national plan is going to be the big stepping stone for this. And if it takes a little bit longer than we would like to get that right, then frankly, so what? Because there's no point in hurrying and getting it less than right. Uh, I have no idea what the answer to that should be. I couldn't dream of putting a number on it. But I think we must be very careful to make sure that the first national plan really does set out something which is understood by everybody to be good. Which listed authorities should be and who should talk to each other is not something on which I would want to comment. And I'm very grateful we've got an advisory group which it sounds as though is going to set us in, in, in good stead. But can I endorse Gordon MacDonald's uh, comments about avoiding duplication? Could we please, please ensure that we have a system which is set up, which has, uh, here's, a, here's a template, if you like, of what you ought to do. 
adopt it unless you have good reasons for not doing so. If you've got to change it, then consider why you've got to change it. And if, for example, and I represent a rural community, you need to have a different perspective from the inner cities, um, and that might be perfectly possible for all sorts of very obvious reasons, then talk to the other rural communities about how you might modify it so we only have one modification rather than 17. I think public authorities maybe have an opportunity here to do something that they manifestly haven't done sometimes in the past. I think the point has already been made that we have to consult users. If we don't consult BSL users on this, of course we're going to get it wrong. Now, if the purpose of this bill is to get BSL into the mainstream, and those are my phrase, words rather than anybody else's, and if it's to build up plans and put together plans as to how we might do that, then surely we already know some of the answers. We know, do we not, that we're going to need more interpreters. Simply because if public bodies are going to do their engagement properly, they're going to need them. I think we can see that coming. Secondly, we're going to need more people who work within these organisations to do what Dennis Robertson described earlier on about getting level one. I have no idea what that means, but the basic skills to communicate in BSL so that we know that the person in front of me is a BSL speaker rather than French or German or whatever other language you want to come up with. So I think we can already see that those skills are going to be needed in large measure, and somebody somewhere might already be thinking about how we do that, how we fund it, how we organise it, because we can see it coming. Could you draw to a close, please? I will indeed. I think, presiding officer, we need to get to the point as a society where we recognise the place of BSL as a language. I think this bill is trying to nudge us in that direction, and I sincerely hope that it succeeds. Thank you. Thank you. I now call Jane Baxter to be followed by Christine Graham. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I would like to thank my colleague Mark Griffin for bringing this bill to Parliament. It relates to an important issue for many people in Scotland. It is also appropriate that this bill is introduced during Deaf Awareness Week. Around 12,500 respondents to the most recent census indicated that they use British Sign Language at home. There are approximately 120 children born in Scotland each year with a hearing impairment. Over 1,000 children and young people under the age of 19 in Scotland have severe or profound hearing loss. For many of these young people, BSL is the only method of communication that they have ever known. From my experience as a counsellor and an MSP, I have learned that many BSL users struggle to get the services they are entitled to, and sometimes it falls to them to make it easier for public services to respond. Like my constituent who needed some housing repairs and couldn't communicate with the local housing office. He took a video on his iPad and sent it to the council and that got a really good response. It's actually a pretty effective technique for anyone to use, but solutions like that are not always available. It's clear then that BSL is used by a large number of people from all backgrounds and circumstances in Scotland. This bill is a positive contribution to their lives. This is a relatively modest bill. It does not impose an explicit statutory requirement on authorities to provide British Sign Language interpreters or translation services, nor does it require them to deliver any specific services to BSL users or those wishing to learn BSL. The bill also does not apply to sign language communicated in other languages or to other forms of communication that may be required by the deaf and hearing impaired community. Its goals are specific. Nonetheless, it is an important bill and one that will be a substantial step forward for BSL users across Scotland. The current arrangements contained in the Equality Act 2010 do not go far enough to take into account the specific needs and requirements of the deaf and hearing impaired community. The Equality Act is an important piece of legislation, putting the rights and needs of minority groups at the heart of the work and decisions taken by public bodies across the United Kingdom. With this bill, we have the opportunity here at the Scottish Parliament to build on their work for the deaf and hearing impaired community. But once we consider that the provisions of the Equality Act that apply to deaf and hearing impaired people are those which cover disabled people, an issue arises. As a Scottish Government paper from 2009 describes, deaf BSL users consider themselves as a distinct language group and not disabled. They have a unique culture, history and life experience as a language minority 
and feel that action to improve their inclusion in society should be based on exactly the same language approach to other groups, such as speakers of Gaelic or of Welsh. In effect, BSL is for many deaf and hearing impaired people their first language. They have communicated using it for their entire lives. They do not accept that it is a manifestation of a disability, but rather a, an expression of their cultural identity and a part of who they are. We should ensure that this feeling is recognised across government. This bill would assist in achieving such recognition. The bill requires Scottish ministers to promote and facilitate the use and understanding of the sign language known as British Sign Language by setting out and publishing a plan to be known as a British Sign Language National Plan for Scotland. This is a positive move. It would not place an excessive burden on the Scottish Government, but would allow the BSL and hearing impaired community to work with them to establish and maintain good practice for authorities to use when working with and providing services to them. The bill would operate much like the Gaelic, the Gaelic Language Scotland Act 2005, without the need for a new statutory body to be set up, as was in that Act. A really important provision of the bill is the plan to set up an advisory group to advise the Scottish Ministers on how to set up and implement the plan. This group would include BSL users and experts in the field. And I believe that this group would be of use, not just for the explicit purposes of this Act, but in order to act as a conduit for the BSL, deaf and hearing impaired community to liaise and communicate with the Scottish Government. The voices of this community are heard all too rarely in making legislation and other government activities in this country. The, act the advisory group could be a major force for good in this area. As I've already noted, there are thousands of BSL users in Scotland. Sadly, there are nowhere near enough interpreters. In Scotland, we have less than 100 interpreters for BSL. Many people have family members or friends who do this on their behalf. Many others are not so fortunate. We should look at this closely and seek a solution to what is clearly a failure of supply and demand. It may also be that we should encourage more widespread take-up of BSL amongst employees in frontline services such as councils, job centres and health services. I'd also like to take a moment to praise recent development in relation to BSL. The recent development of remote BSL interpreters for users of public services in Scotland is a positive one. I believe and hope that their approach to BSL is one that is encouraged by this bill. Returning to the specific provisions and implications of the bill, the Scottish Government has indicated that it would like to amend the bill in order to place the review of the National Plan on a seven-year review cycle. This is unsatisfactory and not in the spirit of the bill. It is important that each Government reviews its own progress and justifies its own actions. That is why it is imperative that the plan is reviewed on a five-year review cycle. This will ensure that the Scottish Ministers are held accountable by Parliament and BSL users for their plan. To conclude, this bill would make BSL users in Scotland's lives better. It would ensure that they are able to access public services and feel that their distinct culture is accepted and encouraged in Scotland. It would help BS users to go to college, to college and university and take part in community activities. I believe that this bill is a well thought out one and should be supported by all parties across the Chamber today. Thank you very much. I remind members that speeches are six minutes. Please, I call Christine Graham to be followed by Chick Brody. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Deputy Presiding Officer. Can I add my congratulations to Mark Griffin? I've brought a member's bill through this parliament myself. I know it's hard going and I also know it's quite difficult for a member to appear before a committee and look for a gentle interrogation. Uh, I have another bill coming, so I'm letting myself in for it again. But it does again demonstrate the value of a member's bill, which is usually very consensual in this parliament and shows us with a different personality. As others have said, over three quarters of a million people in Scotland suffer from a severe hearing impairment. And Jane Baxter has told us how many in the Scottish census it said that they use BSL. And I'm glad that question was on the census paper. In my own constituency, in Midlothian, 233 responded that they used it, and in the borders, 228 which has galvanised me into looking into exactly what provision is made by the various service agencies across my constituency. But I, and I think it's very important that the bill embeds the status of BSL as a language, and I suspect that will increase these numbers. But I want to specifically turn to section 3, subsection 
three, which I've alerted the minister to already, I accept that he's now going to proceed with a national plan instead of all the little uh, local plans. But I note that the plan is to set out measures to be taken by the listed authority in relation to the use of BSL in connection with the exercise of the authority's functions. I, I look forward to an answer to which of the authorities listed in Schedule 2, which I have in front of me, will be subsumed into this national authority. I don't know if they're all, but I want to turn to some within my own particular interest of justice, where I think there must be huge issues about people involved in proceedings who have difficulties with hearing. Let's take just simply children's hearings. Crucial to those with a hearing loss that they understand the proceedings, whether they are the subject of the proceedings or whether they are parents or carers who may be in danger of losing contact with children. The Mental Welfare Commission, where issues such as compulsory treatment or indeed removal of liberty are issues under discussion. The Scottish Court Service, this would apply not only in criminal proceedings, but civil proceedings, disputes about contact with children, contractual disputes, and all the way from the court of session to the small claims court, where you might be contesting the fact that your washing machine that you paid for is not up to scratch. This, of course, embraces also the Crown and Procurator Fiscal Service, and indeed the Scottish Prison Service. And I think there's a huge issue here when liberty and rights are under challenge that everyone taking part understands the proceedings. Indeed, there must be an issue of convention of human rights, whether you are in fact having a fair hearing in being part of the proceedings or even understanding them. This takes us even to the Scottish Tribunal Service dealing, say, with matters of employment and employment rights. The Scottish Legal Aid Board, crucial to whether or not you receive financial support to have an interpreter or translator available at all stages of a case. When you're speaking to your solicitor, explaining the position, the solicitor is responding, whether you've been given legal advice, whether proceedings are being drawn up, which you must understand, and at the end of the day, the process in court and the final determination, all of which I think is essential that they have access to BSL if necessary. Which takes me to the emergency services, the Scottish Ambulance Service, Police Scotland, Fire and Rescue, all must be embraced in having access to BSL services where literally there's matters of life or death or serious injury. And the question, of course, is after all that goodwill, do we have sufficient trained interpreters? Well, the answer must be no, because the Scottish Association of Sign Language Interpreters have 66, the National Register of Communication Professionals, 46, deaf-blind interpreters, single figures, and more worryingly, in training, 10 under SESLI and 8 under NRCPD. So there's no point in good plans without practicalities that can't deliver. And my question is this, and I don't know the answer, apart from the one about which national plan applies to the various agencies. Is it possible to use technology in the fora that I've mentioned? Automatic translation into BSL without actually having to have it, and have somebody there at the time where you could have automatic translation, perhaps with a time delay. Many of our courts have technology, and I don't know whether a programme could be developed that would enable this to take place, perhaps if it's a remote court where you're not going to be able to have an actual person there, whether you can do it remotely or by whatever means. We are a sophisticated generation. Let's try to look at sophisticated as well as personal ways of making sure that those with hearing impairment are engaged at every stage of what I focused on, the judicial process, in the widest terms. Thank you. Thank you very much. And I now call on Chuck Brodie to be followed by Dr Richard Simpson. Thank Six you, minutes Presiding or thereby. Thank you. Uh, I too welcome this report. And I, uh, <coughs> may I firstly applaud Mark Griffin 
uh, for having the foresight and tenacity in bringing this bill forward. It is perhaps regrettable that we are not, indeed cannot, uh, conduct this bill, each of us, in our speeches, uh, but who knows what the future will bring uh, uh, in terms of BSL communication. Of course, we do, however, have our wonderful uh, professional interpreters with us today to help. Presiding officer, in my early years in Dundee, while my father was in the Navy, uh, his brother, my uncle, my uncle Joe, became a father figure to me. He was deaf. It was caused by an accident when he was five years old. But he taught me what was then basic sign language, which I can still uh, remember. The fingers on our left hands, for example, uh, formatting the vowels of our alphabet, A, E, I, O, U. Now, I rarely spoke for the first three years of my life. As some people suggest I should follow that tradition uh, today. But as a newcomer to the Education Committee, I was delighted that this bill was my introduction to the committee's work. Uh, and uh, to place on record the valuable contributions and insights to sign language that we received at Falkirk, Edinburgh and elsewhere. While, of course, I and others support the bill and its general principles, its promotion is to be over the long term. In, in the interest of full inclusion of all in our society, I might have preferred a more robust intervention to legislate for public service bodies over the shorter term, in particular, to embrace the further employment of those who are deaf and to establish the profile and the means of an effective uh, communication therein. Presiding officer, accepted communication, BSL language promotion and education, particularly to those uh, of a very young age, and, and technology can generate more inclusion, as would a significant increase, uh, as has been mentioned, in the number of interpreters of deaf language. The difficulties faced by the deaf, for example, seeking and understanding medical analysis and treatment, or faced by questions they may have on the many local council services or on rail and air travel, uh, are immense. These difficulties are sometimes too immense for the hearing, let alone uh, the deaf. And it was suggested, presiding officer, that while the, 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 the we, the hearing, have call centres on almost everything from those public services, to medical services, to financial services, it cannot be beyond the wit of our technologists with further development of existing applications, with features like Skype and with more interpreters, it cannot be difficult to create similar video call centre arrangements uh, sometimes in future so that our deaf uh, citizens uh, can deal effectively with the challenges posed to them. As it is, programmes, and as it will be, the, pro the progress uh, amended. This bill certainly would and will raise the profile of the bill and its benefits to not just, not just the deaf community, but indeed to the wider community. Raising the profile is important, but more important is increasing its use. We fully accept the Government and the Finance Committee's concern about the financial and bureaucratic burden in creating the national framework and plan uh, as developed by the National Advisory Group. These, of course, are real, but a much greater focus on listed authorities, in particular local authorities, establishing a framework to achieve improved performance outcomes, I believe, is paramount. The development of planned outcomes with regard to BSL use and the deaf community must be matched by actions by those accepted and listed authorities. In the early stages, these plans or statements uh, need not be onerous, but seen rather as key initial steps on the journey we plan to take to achieve a national awakening with regard to how we include and communica communicate better with the deaf or hard of hearing. Presiding officer, this bill should underpin through its higher profile, should complement and should embrace existing equality legislation which the conclusions to stage one state, and which identifies the deaf as disabled. They are evidently not. Mr Griffin highlighted that many supporters and BSL users focused on the need for increased recognition of the bill as an indigenous language of Scotland. Quite right. Comparisons have been drawn with other countries of a similar 
population size, but with greater language training and interpretation provision. In this area, being anything other than first, frankly, in my book, is not good enough. Of course, it'll take time. Of course, it'll take amendments. And of course, a defined performance framework. But again, I applaud Mark Griffin for bringing this bill forward now. My uncle Joe will be very happy. This is not the first from the floor of this chamber today, but in his memory, can I say, Thank you, Presiding Officer. Thank you, Mr. Brody. I now call on Dr. Richard Simpson to be followed by Richard Lyle. Thank you, Presiding Officer. I want to join with others in congratulating Mark Griffin on bringing forward this bill and indeed the committee on its report and the manner in which they consulted, which I thought was, an, was exemplary. There is, of course, the United Nations Convention on the Rights of the Person and with Disabilities, which came into force in 2008 and was ratified by the UK in 2009. And existing legislation, such as the Equality Act 2010, the Patient Rights Act Scotland 2011, the Educational uh, Additional Support for Learning Scotland Acts of 2004 and 2009, uh, all of which afford some protection for deaf people by requiring the needs of the individual service users to be met. But this bill, promoting BSL language, if fully implemented, could help advance the aspirations of those who are deaf and help the 120 children born with profound deafness out of around 58,000 annual births in Scotland. It can identify the gaps in support and identify any postcode variations. There could be no doubt that the 12,533 respondents who reported using BSL at home uh, in Scotland's census 2011 do need more support. But at least, unlike the English census, we do ask the specific question, agreed as a result of Jack Connell McConnell beginning to address the BSL deficit. So can I ask the Minister whether this bill will ensure, or he will ensure, that even if the census is abandoned, as it may well be, that we will still have good data of this sort, because it is fundamental to the measurement of progress. In 2000, a working group was set up in the Scottish Executive and in one form or another, it continues to this day. A paper on languages, including BSL, was published in February 2007. And in 2014, the working group started work on an update to the roadmap in order to identify where progress had been made and to highlight priority action areas for action. And this update was to be published in early 2015. I was unable to find it, and I don't know if the minister can provide us with a link or if not a date as to whether that report is going to be available. So I thought, coming at it not from the committee angle and not from the particular angle of the bill, that I'd try and look at it slightly differently and look at the progress that we've made. The Equality and Human Rights Commission in Scotland have estimated, as I reported last week, only 0.2% participation rate by disabled young persons in the apprentice, modern apprenticeship scheme, 79 out of 26,000. How many of those were, did, had profound deafness? Well, we just don't know. But the statistics from the Scottish Council on deafness do show that up to 70% of deaf people believe that they failed to get a job because of their deafness. Now, I did raise this issue last week, and I hope that in reporting disabilities in the future, we will get an idea of the number and types of disability. These numbers, of course, as we know, are hugely lower than they are in England. Only 0.2% in Scotland compared to 8.7% in England. There may be an explanation for that, of course. Yes, certainly, uh, Mr Robertson. <clears throat> Dennis Robertson. Uh, does the member accept that the BSL community themselves are suggesting that their language is not a disability? And they are hoping that this bill can take forward the fact that it's a language and not disability. Fully accept what the member can add on some time for the intervention. Thank you. I, I fully accept what the member is saying, but what I'm trying to address is where this takes us, because language is obviously has a purpose, and the purpose of that language is good communication skills, and in the workplace, that is absolutely fundamental. So ensuring that, the, that, the, that this is not a barrier to access is, is important. 
On education, we have a problem too. Uh, the figures have been quoted earlier, but 36.4% of deaf pupils obtaining hires compared to 60.2% of hearing pupils. And the numbers advancing into higher education, where again, we need to have support for them, is only 26% compared to 39% of hearing school leavers. And 52% of deaf people felt they had been prevented from pursuing further training or education because of their deafness or lack of effective communication support services. Now, on our NHS, which as some members have referred to, again, the statistics from SCOD show that up to 35% of deaf people had experienced difficulty communicating with a local GP. And I can say that as a GP, when I was confronted with someone who was profoundly deaf, communication was not easy. And being able to obtain a BSL communicator or interpreter uh, wasn't, always, wasn't always possible. 77% of BSL users who visited hospital could not easily communicate with NHS staff. The Financial Times reported recently that the, there's been a cut in real terms in spending on education. And it's interesting to note that this parliament decided to abolish the graduate endowment fee, but that was actually never charged to anyone with deafness. So its abolition hasn't really helped. It is important in the educational setting that we do ensure that individuals are maintained. And I just wonder out of the 140,000 cuts in college places, uh, which I am told has affected those with disabilities more, whether that actually has affected people uh, with deaf problems more th than others. Now, the, the outcome of this not being a sufficient priority to us as a parliament is demonstrated in the fact that, as again, as others have said, in December 2014, there were 78 sign language interpreters re registered with SALSI service. 66 BSL interpreters, 10 trainee interpreters, and only two that can offer deaf-blind manual three interpreting. Now, I just wonder, nobody has so far quoted the Nordic countries, which is common in our debates, and yet Finland, with a similar, num similar population to ours, has 790 interpreters. Uh, and, and so there's clearly a long way for us to go. So I wonder if the minister can give an indication if we've got more interpreters now than we had? Has there been a growth? Uh, is there intended to be a target for the number of interpreters? How many courses are there for BSL available in Scotland? Uh, I, I really hope some of these questions can be answered and that the bill will promote this. Uh, Deputy Presiding Officer, to finish with, I'm glad that we're supporting, I hope, today the principles of this bill. I know Cathy Gregie will be pleased, um, but I hope that this bill will only be the starting point for developing services which can allow full inclusion and participation of, of those who suffer from profound deafness. Many thanks. Now call on Richard Lyle, after which we'll move to the closing speeches. Thank you, President Officer. Can I begin by saying how much it is a privilege it is to speak in the stage one debate on a proposed British Sign Language Bill, particularly as a member of this Parliament's Health and Sport Committee. I also would like to take the opportunity to commend Mark Griffin for bringing this important bill before Parliament. It is important to begin, I believe, by saying that I, like many other members this afternoon in this chamber, support the principles of the British Sign Language Bill. And I believe that it will do well in working towards raising the awareness of British Sign Language and, important, and importantly, to encourage others, and particularly those in public bodies, to meet to better meet the needs of BSL users. Across this chamber, we recognise that deaf British Sign Language users are often marginalised and excluded because they do not have ling linguistic access to a, a wide range of information, services and other opportunities, and therefore, because of this, they are unable to make their full and important contribution to daily and public life in Scotland. In Scotland alone, they are estimated, as already has been said, around 6,500 people who use sign language, and they deserve to have the same access to services as everyone else. Therefore, this bill paves the way for a greater action to resolve this. The implementation of the bill, particularly the production of a BSL national plan, will build on the work we have undertaken in partnership with the BSL Ling Linguistic Access Working Group since 2000. A different approach is therefore needed to raise awareness of BSL as a language and encourage, enable and support public bodies to better need, meet the needs of the deaf community. And that's what this bill does. 
Not only that, President Officer, but it recognises and supports BSL as a language rather than just a means of communication support. That is a significant difference. I think it is important and right that whilst we debate this bill, we recognise and champion some of the excellent examples of work that have been done to promote and support the use of BSL and help meet the needs of the deaf community. And together, we recognise that more can and must be done by government and across the public sector to continue making a difference. It must be said that I believe that this government has already taken steps to promote and support BSL through a number of activities. They have worked cro closely with the BSL uh, and the Access Working Group. They have increased funding to support the infrastructure for teaching and learning of BSL and to improve the engagement with the deaf community. And I note that we are working continually to enable and encourage schools to offer, over, offer BSL as a subject alongside other more modern languages. And in 2011, there was a ministerial statement to this parliament which officially recognised BSL as a language. Through these activities, we have increased the profile of BF BSL and teach BSL at a higher level and develop a better understanding of the language. But it's now it is now time to take the next step and the bill enables us to do that. Whilst we should recognise that there may be costs involved in delivering improvements, I believe failing to meet the, the needs of BSL users will result in additional costs, not only at a personal and societal level, but for local authorities too. In saying this, I mean that one of the consequences of public bodies and local authorities not having to think more formally about services for deaf people is that deaf people are left behind in a way that creates a cost to society through the personal cost to them in terms of educational opportunities, the attainment gap, employment problems they may face. This isn't what I nor this Parliament should want for any of our people. In the memorandum from this Government, they have set out an estimated total cost for the implementation of the Bill as proposed of £6 million over four years. However, in line with current investment, the Scottish Government will likely to invest around £2 million over the period 2016-20 in BSL, reducing the estimated cost to around £4 million. And as already has been stated, health, health costs may be reduced a result, a, as a result of this Bill. Presiding officer, we benefit tremendously from the contribution that the deaf community make to our country, to our economy, and we should promote, protect, support and value their language and their culture. This bill goes quite some way to improve the lives of the deaf community in Scotland. And once again, I commend and thank Mark Griffin for all the hard work that he's done in the last number of months for bringing this bill before Parliament. And as already has been said by many members who have already spoke, I, at five o'clock, intend to support the principle of this bill, and I commend it to everyone in this chamber. Thank you. Many thanks. And we now move to closing speeches and call on Mary Spa Scanlon. Uh, up to seven minutes, please. <coughs> thank you, presiding officer. <coughs> Uh, and I would also like to thank every member who has spoken. I think it's been a very well-informed, measured debate uh, and indeed many constructive suggestions, which uh, as a member of the Education Committee, I think uh, will lead to further discussion for us in future. But as many members have said, there's no doubt that people who are profoundly deaf are often marginalised and excluded as they do not have linguistic access to information and, or services and I think each and every one of us today has borne that in mind and tried to say well the bill goes so far can it go a little bit further and can we be assured that it will lead to that upgrade in the provision of services and uh, I think that is to be commended. Um, I would also uh, welcome the setting up of the National Advisory Group to support the implementation of the Bill, and I hope that they will adhere to the principles and the hopes uh, contained in this legislation and by each uh, member who has spoken today. I fully understand the difficulties associated with the first performance review in terms of uh, <coughs> collection 
uh, of data, given that there does seem to be scant information about the current level of service and support. Uh, the lack of baseline data or performance indicators is an issue, and I note the Government will lodge an amendment on this issue to hopefully bring some clarity. Inclusion Scotland state that there are 57,000 people in Scotland with severe and profound deafness, with around 6,000 people for whom BSL is their sole or main language. Inclusion Scotland, in their briefing paper, say that there are only 30 qualified BSL interpreters currently operating. Now, I'm not saying they're wrong, but many other figures have been given today. Uh, NDCS state that there are about 80 qualified BSL interpreters. So further baseline information on these figures, we seem to know more about Finland and the exact figures in Finland than we do about our own country. So any further baseline information has to be very helpful. Um, as NDCS also state, without a basic understanding of the numbers of deaf children and their needs, it's difficult for national and local government to effectively plan service delivery. I think that's fair. They also make a good point that a large number of deaf and hard of hearing people may also have accessible communication needs, which will not be addressed by the provisions of the bill, and that the promotion of BSL should not be at the expense of other accessible communications. And I appreciate that other members have also mentioned this today. So, although we all support the promotion of BSL, I was very persuaded by the NDCS paper uh, by the proposal to improve the availability of family sign language, which enhances the ability of hearing parents to communicate with their deaf children, a fundamental right, surely, to promote their development. Helping the child and also helping the families must be a positive way forward, given that 90% of deaf children are born to hearing parents. It is shocking that there is currently no nationally funded provision for these parents to access appropriate training or classes in order to communicate with their child through sign language. Although NDCS does have an early years project. So not only has family sign language provision improved vocabulary for deaf children, but it also contributes to positive family relationship as a result of parents having better communication with, with their uh, children. So I would be keen to see provision and support for families to help families communicate with their children. I would like also to see that in the progress reports and the performance reviews. Uh, I don't know whether I've got to bring forward an amendment, but uh, I did mention it earlier, and Mark Griffin seemed to be uh, hopeful. So I would like to hope that the Minister would see the help for families as being something that could be mentioned in the performance reviews, in the progress plans, uh, the National Advisory Group. Surely we need to help families to help their children. Um, I also thought the Law Society filed a very good briefing um, seeking greater, greater clarity on many aspects of the bill. And of course, we've heard some very good points today from the convener of the Justice Committee. Uh, Christine Graham. But they made a very good point, <clears throat> I have to say I wasn't aware of, but others have mentioned it, by stating that public bodies in Scotland also have a legal obligation under Section 149 of the Equality Act 2010, the Public Sector Equality Duty, to eliminate discrimination, promote equal opportunities and foster good relations between different groups. So what I'm really asking is that the defining question has to be if someone is being discriminated against on the basis of a disability, if someone does not enjoy equal opportunities, if there are not good relations, in other words, if public bodies are not adhering to the legal obligation under Section 149, then where do they go? 
Where to the court? Yes, I'm happy to do that. Dennis yeah, Roberts. Thank you, Presiding Officer. Once again, can I say that um, I think that those using BSL are keen to promote that it is not a disability. And although there is disability legislation that ensures fuller access to perhaps other things, we are talking language and not disability. No, I appreciate that. I, I do appreciate that. But, you know, as the Law Society have said, there is a, a legal obligation, uh, you know, to eliminate discrimination, promote equal opportunities. But all I'm saying is we're very good at passing legislation in this parliament, but we're not very good at saying to people, well, if it's not implemented as we hoped it would be implemented, if it's not perfectly implemented, so where do they go? And for, we've been here for 16 years, and I do think that people who find that the service falls well short of their needs, we need to be able to say to them, well, if it's not working for you, this is the door to knock on. And I'm not sure we have that yet. But I put that in a constructive way because we are fully supporting the bill, and it's been an excellent uh, debate today. Thank you. Many thanks. And I now call on Rhoda Grant, seven minutes or thereby, please. Um, thank you, Presiding Officer. Um, can I, like others, congratulate Mark Griffin um, for bringing forward this bill? Um, and we have heard that it attracts widespread support um, from throughout the Parliament. It's also timely to have the Stage 1 debate in Deaf Awareness Week, and I think um, that was possibly good planning by the Parliament, but maybe not quite that organised, it was maybe a good chance. Um, the bill will focus on promoting BSL um, language throughout Scotland. And as we've heard, there are many estimations about the number of BSL speakers we have in Scotland, some as low as 6,000, but some higher um, than 12,500. So we need to make sure that those people, are, are their language is protected and have the language uh, officially recognised um, as a full and, and independent language, as the UK did in March 2003 in the Scottish Government in 2011. Um, we need to go further, however, because that has obviously proved not, good, not, not enough. Um, 120 children are born each year with severe or profound hearing loss, making it really difficult to learn a spoken language. And Margaret McCulloch, in her speech, um, told us that the deaf community are demanding change and promotion of their own language. Um, and I'm sure that is why Mark Griffin brought forward um, these, this bill to, to meet those demands. Siobhan McMahon and indeed many other speakers um, talked in the debate about deaf people do not see themselves as disabled. They need um, access and recognition to their own language. But can I maybe build on that slightly in that many people that we term disabled um, actually do not believe that they are disabled. They are, aspire to the social model of disability, which, which says that disability is caused by the way that society is organised rather than a person's impairment or difference. And it looks at ways of removing barriers that restrict life and choices for disabled people because um, different abilities are ignored in a society that is designed very much for the majority. And the deaf community in Scotland face barriers in their everyday lives that stem um, not from the barriers caused by their deafness, but from the distinct lack of understanding of BSL and their own language. So therefore, recognising BSL as a language in its own right is a step in the right direction. And hopefully we'll continue to break down these barriers that we all put in place, not only for the deaf community, but indeed other communities that feel that society puts barriers in their place rather than trying to break them down. A number of speakers um, talked about access um, to services and Richard Simpson talked about legislation um, that currently demands that needs of service users are met, but we see so often that this falls down. Um, communication with medical staff, education or other authorities and indeed a lack of interpreters. Um, the Scottish Gover Government figures for 2011-12 show that 36.4% of deaf pupils attained 
hires or advanced hires, and that's compared with 60.2 of hearing pupils. Um, and indeed, Mark Griffin himself in his uh, speech talked about only 8% of teachers knowing how to sign, which is a huge barrier for people um, in mainstream education. The STUC, and I think we need to pay tribute to them uh, through Union Learning run uh, BSL courses, and I attended one, um, and I really enjoyed it. It was quite strange how easy it was to pick up, indeed how intuitive it was, but it was very difficult um, to keep those skills up if you're not using it on a regular basis. So that's maybe um, something we need to look at in the future. We need to look at um, um, including it in the curriculum, not only just as a language, but as we've heard today, the culture, the history is really important to be taught and learned as well, because the people's history is very much taken down um, in, in their language. And if we don't use the language, then we miss out to that kind of rich tapestry that is very seldom recorded. Christine Graham talked about the justice system um, and access to courts, children's panels and indeed wider justice. And I think it is a point well made. If you can't access the justice system, then you are being discriminated against. Um, others, many speakers talked about health. And, you know, we depend on communication when we go to see our GP, a doctor, and indeed to be able to tell about symptoms, to get a proper diagnosis. But how much worse must that be at a time of critical illness when you, you're dealing with an emergency or maybe facing very difficult um, news about your own health, that, that you need to be able to communicate well. And not only the person going for the assistant need, needing to communicate well, but the person giving bad news needs to be able to communicate that properly. Nigel Dawn talked about um, mental health and the impact of exclusion on somebody's mental health. And I think that's something we need to bear in mind. But if we talk about talking therapies and the like, dealing with mental health problems, again, how impossible is that if someone can't speak your language? So we really need to make sure that there are people there um, who, can, who can have those conversations and uh, provide those therapies in someone's own language. And, um, Richard Simpson also talked about the workplace, and I think that's why um, the STUC were really keen on teaching BSL to make sure that workplaces were, were accessible, but we need to go an awful lot further. Um, Mary Scanlon mentioned a number of times about BSL for families, and I think that is hugely important because a child starts to learn almost immediately, and if the parents aren't able to communicate, yes, of course we all use signs, and we do that with young children as well, but the, the sooner a child starts to learn the language, the better, and the person that child is going to learn that language from is their parents. So it's really important when a child is born um, who needs to learn BSL that the parents are immediately taught BSL and they can almost learn it along with the child as long as they're one step ahead to make sure that that child is learning. Presiding officer, we've heard of widespread support um, for the bill from BSL users and indeed um, many others beyond. Uh, we've also heard how the bill was scrutinised by the committee at stage one and how they opened up the Facebook page and that led me to thinking and I think Jane Baxter's constituent kind of demonstrated that um, the use that could be made of new social media um, to, to communicate for people using BSL through video clips on on Twitter on Facebook and indeed the use of Skype to deal with other with service providers. Presiding officer. Stuart Maxwell. I, I, I'm grateful for you raising this issue of um, use of digital, modern digital technology. Um, it struck me that uh, as we go about our daily lives, not critical services, but normal public services like announcements at a railway station or announcements at an airport, um, they're all pre-recorded, um, or many of them are pre-recorded, and yet they have digital screens available. There are no pre-recorded messages which could be put out saying the train has been moved from platform six to platform nine using BSL. I think there are many opportunities that are there using the new modern digital technologies which could be used, but frankly I think many organisations haven't yet thought to use them. And briefly, Rhoda Grant. Um, I absolutely agree and maybe slightly flippantly if that was the case given how difficult it is to hear some of those announcements, we would all learn BSL just to know when, if our train is late or if indeed it's going to arrive at all. Um, presiding officer, just can I close by congratulating Mark Griffin again for bringing the bill forward and I'm sure his family are very proud of him. Um, but more than that, the BSL users will be delighted 
Yes, of course, it, would, it could go further, but this bill is a start and a journey, not the end. And I hope, very much hope that the Parliament will unite and support it tonight. Thank you very much. And I call on Dr Alistair Allen, eight minutes or thereby. Please, Dr Allen. Well, uh, can I say, Presiding Officer, I think this has been one of the most genuinely constructive and positive debates I've certainly had a chance to be involved in in this Parliament. Uh, and I hope it's a, a debate whose content has meant a great deal to the many people who've uh, campaigned uh, for a long time uh, to bring legislation of this kind before this Parliament. Now, as anybody who knows me will know, I have personal interest in languages of all kinds. And I think it has been important throughout the debate today, uh, as Stuart Maxwell and many others have mentioned, uh, that this is uh, a piece of legislation, proposed legislation, which seeks to offer some status to a language. It is not merely about the issue of disability, important as that issue is. Dennis Robertson uh, made that uh, wider point about language uh, when he talked about where uh, this language, BSL, fits into our picture of world languages, if you like. Uh, and that is, of course, very relevant to the efforts that are taking place uh, in our schools in Scotland uh, to introduce uh, much greater uh, exposure to languages, including PSL. Margaret McCulloch rightly pointed out the importance uh, of the plans that the bill mentions, or, or perhaps more uh, accurately, as she mentioned, uh, the content of those plans, uh, which will lead us uh, over uh, the coming months, I'm sure, uh, into a, a real discussion uh, about how we involve very fully uh, the BSL community in uh, their production of those plans. Uh, on the likely government amendments, Jane Baxter and others uh, have raised the issue of the length, for instance, of the cycle of uh, the language plans. Uh, I should make it clear, however, at this point that uh, the reason that the, uh, the government has, has raised a question uh, about the five-year cycle uh, in the bill uh, as tabled uh, is not motivated by some desire to uh, avoid ministerial responsibility for the, the, the conduct of this or the, the achievement of this, the aims of this legislation within five year parliamentary terms. It, it is simply, if I can be honest, uh, because uh, the experience of the, of the Gaelic language uh, legislation, important although that has been uh, for the language, does teach us that. We, we cannot put organisations in a position where they are continually producing plans, important as they are, and we have to have a debate about what the best uh, length of that, that cycle is. Uh, Richard Simpson uh, asked, when will the review, uh, I think I, I, I picked him up right, when will the review of the roadmap be published? Uh, I should say this was carried out by the Scottish Council on Deafness and will be published on their website. Christine Graham, if I can offer a second attempt to answer her original question, I hear her say please. Uh, uh, if her question is about the listed authorities not covered uh, by the national plan, uh, perhaps uh, helpful if I exemplify what those body bodies might include. They would include uh, territorial NHS boards, a small number of national bodies uh, not directly accountable to ministers, which would include, for instance, things like uh, the Scottish Parliamentary Corporate Body, Audit Scotland and others. That was not an exclusive list. Um, Christine Graham also interestingly raised, interestingly raised the issue about interpreters, uh, a point also made by Dr Simpson and others. The Scottish Government is currently putting, uh, or has been uh, over the last few years, putting £1.5 million pounds into an apprenticeship-based model to try to address the very uh, need to increase the number uh, of interpreters that we have. Contact Scotland is one such effort which does uh, make use uh, of various technological uh, solutions to, to promote and make further use of a limited number of interpreters. Although, again, on Christine Graham's question there, uh, none of that obviates the need for human interpreters, notwithstanding the point that Stuart Maxwell did make about the fact uh, that there is considerable scope for pre-recorded messages to be used in other contexts. I'd like just to say, uh, by way of uh, the rest of my offering uh, uh, this afternoon, just to put some of the, the bill in, in context and to talk about uh, some of the steps that this government is already taking uh, to promote and support BSL through a number of activities. 
through, for instance, uh, significant funding to support the infrastructure for teaching and learning of BSL, to improve our engagement with the deaf community, enabling and encouraging schools to offer BSL as a subject, as I mentioned, alongside other modern languages, and setting up a pilot online interpreting pilot uh, for BSL users wishing to access public services directly by phone. Now, through all of these activities, we have made progress, but it is time to take the next step, and the bill, I believe, allows us to do that. We have a good idea of the longer-term outcomes we want to achieve, having worked closely with the BSL and Linguistic Access Working Group throughout our time in office. And as Gordon MacDonald referred to, as a government, we supported the publication of the group's report, uh, the Roadmap to Linguistic Access, which set out eight long-term aims to improve linguistic access for deaf and deafblind people. But there is, of course, an awful lot more to do, and we will draw on the expertise of the new BSL National Advisory Group to determine what priorities should be included in the national plan. So I would like to pick up on some of the specific points uh, around that. Uh, for instance, uh, Mary Scanlon uh, made a very important point about uh, deaf children uh, born into hearing families. And the Scottish Government wants Scotland to be genuinely the best place for everyone to grow up. Uh, so we have recognised the importance of supporting families with a, who have families who have a deaf baby providing over half a million pounds to the National Deaf Children's Society uh, in 2011 to 2016 for its family sign project. The second, sorry, the, the other issue uh, perhaps uh, for later on in a child's life uh, is that once a child reaches school, we are committed to ensuring that deaf pupils who use BSL get the support they need uh, to achieve their potential. While we recognise there is much more to do, overall it is important to say I believe things are improving, with the latest Scottish Government data showing an increase in the number of deaf pupils moving into further education and employment. That is not to take away from the reality that many, mentioned, many members have mentioned uh, of the attainment gap that still exists. I am sure that uh, many members will agree with me that uh, deaf people who use BSL should be able to access public services in the same way as their hearing peers. That should be the aim that all of us have. And that's why earlier this year we announced the extension of the NHS 24 online British Sign Language video relay interpreting service uh, to ensure that that equality is further promoted. Presiding officer, in my earlier contribution, I emphasised the importance of effective engagement between the BSL community and the public bodies who serve them. I mentioned funding that has recently been awarded to five organisations to help support this. And together I hope that uh, they will develop and uh, deliver a cohesive programme of work around that. I want to say in conclusion, presiding officer, um, that as the Minister for Scotland's Languages, I'm honoured to have responsibility on behalf of the Government uh, for BSL and for responding to this bill. I look forward to playing my role in giving the language the support and protection it deserves through the provisions of this bill, and the Government remains very happy to work and to continue to help develop uh, the bill as it makes its way through Parliament. Thank you. Can I now call on Mark Griffin to wind up? Ten minutes, Mr Griffin. Thank you, President Officer. I would like to thank the, the Minister and members for their uh, valuable uh, positive contributions to the debate. As I said in my evidence to the Education and Culture Committee on the 17th of March, one of the reasons I have for attempting to introduce a British Sign Language Bill was partly personal. Um, Mary Scanlon had raised it earlier, but didn't quite get it right. It was my, two of my great-grandparents um, who were deaf-blind, and I never met them. They died before I was born, but I was um, brought up um, with stories um, from my mum about how they raised their children, the difficulty they faced, how they interacted with their children, 
um, with their, their grandchildren and um, how they attempted to access services and overcome um, everyday um, activities with a, a dual sensory impairment. And when I became an MSP, I, I joined the cross-party group on deafness and um, where I heard of some of the experiences of people on that group. And it was sad to learn that almost three generations later um, that people were still experiencing the same difficulties in accessing services, including medical and police services, um, and the same difficulties in relation to educational attainment. And it struck me that the language was still marginalised and still, still misunderstood. But during evidence, the Minister for Learning Science and Scotland Languages, Dr Allen provided us with a fitting historical illustration of the cultural roots of sign language in Scotland by citing an example of Joan, the daughter of King James I of Scotland, who died in 1493, who was deaf and used a form of sign language at court. So I thought I would do some research of my own and see if I could match that. And in keeping with the royal theme, I discovered that there was another member of the royal family who used a form of sign language, Alexandra, Princess of Wales, who married a son of Queen Victoria. And it was said that the princess learned fingerspelling and regularly attended deaf services at St Saviour's Church in London. And it's even claimed that she went on to teach Queen Victoria how to sign. Now, I'm under no illusion that this bill is anything other than a, a starting point. That positive first step that Nigel Dawn, Stuart Maxwell um, alluded to, it's that starting point of a continuous cycle of improvement um, for access to services for BSL users. It aims to raise awareness of the language and highlight gaps in provision, as well as identifying and enabling the sharing of good practice. Siobhan McMahon and Gordon MacDonald and I think almost every other speaker in the debate raised the, the issue of um, the number of interpreters that we have where in Scotland we have around 80 British Sign Language interpreters registered, whereas in Finland, um, that country that has gotten a lot of attention in this debate as well, we have a similar population to Scotland. Um, have 750 interpreters. I, I hope that if the, the bill is passed, that the promotion of BSL in public life will lead to a resurgence of the language and an interest among all people in learning the language, creating an upturn in the number of interpreters coming into, coming into the system. It, the Education and Culture Committee heard the evidence from witnesses who gave examples of how the lack of BSL, BSL awareness affected their everyday lives. One witness told the committee about people going into a hospital and waiting hours or, or even months without really knowing what was going on with their treatment because there was no BSL interpreter available to help. Um, Chick Brodie raised the issues around um, interactions with financial institutions, the difficulties caused by data protection and the problems that can cause for, for BSL users who often rely on um, a family member or a friend to, to act on their behalf. And Christine Graham raised issues of access to the, to the justice system. Now, if a BSL user um, needs to go to a solicitor, for example, um, in the process of, of purchasing a house, who, who pays for the interpreter and access to that? and access to that legal service. It, it's the BSL user because um, legal aid doesn't cover the cost of BSL interpreters. And that's just a, a small issue of access to justice and, and justice um, services, which Christine Graham elaborated on, um, covers cases right up to the High Court and any form of appeal or, or tribunal or mental health proceedings. There, there's a real um, difficulty with access to justice um, for, for BSL users. Now, many organisations have already made great progress towards considering the needs of BSL users, and it's time that their experience 
is shared and allow others to, to catch up with them. I, I recognise that it's not possible to wave a magic wand and instantly enable BSL users to start using their own language every time they engage with the health service, educational establishments and so on. I wish I could, but I do believe that this bill is an important first step towards putting BSL on a firmer footing and that it will make a positive difference to the lives of, of BSL users. Um, the point has been raised with the Equalities Act on people accessing, people who use BSL as their um, language accessing services um, by using this means. I think it's, it's important that I say this here now that BSL, deaf BSL users certainly don't define themselves as disabled. They're as um, intellectually, physically capable as any member here and resent the fact that they have to define themselves as being disabled to access services that you and I take for granted. We don't go to a, a foreign country where we don't speak the language and define ourselves as being disabled. It's simply two people who use a different language to communicate and that's what we have to recognise that there is a minority um, in Scotland who use a different language who have no opportunity um, to learn the indigenous spoken language so it's up to us to address that and adapt to our, our services accordingly. Um, Yep, certainly. Dennis Robertson. Uh, thank you very much, Presiding Officer. Uh, the member mentioned, I think, in his earlier uh, remarks, uh, those who are using the deaf blind and deaf blind manual. Uh, and sometimes a person using BSL because of uh, a degenerative um, sight loss after being profoundly deaf sometimes have to uh, amend or adjust their BSL to using that different language. I myself can use the deaf blind manual. Uh, and can use some BSL, but very little. Mr Griffin? Yep, certainly um, the, the impact of, of someone experiencing a, experiencing a fun, further sensory impairment after being deaf and becoming um, deaf-blind and having to amend that language that they've used all their life is clearly a big issue. I'd, I'd mentioned in my opening speech about the particular consideration that has been given to and deaf-blind BSL users, Margaret McCulloch, picked it up in her contribution as well. And as I said, my open contribution, I'm open and have been in discussions with Deafblind Scotland about the potential for an amendment to specifically um, cover um, deaf blindness, um, if, if, that's, if that's possible. There has been a range of contributions this afternoon, if I can pick up as, as many as I can in the minute we have left. I think I, I said earlier that I welcome the amendments that have been tabled in the Minister's name or will be tabled in the Minister's name. I look forward to discussions with the Minister on the detail and indeed very much welcome them because a number of them um, strengthen the bill in, in particular areas. I also welcome the £390,000 of funding that has already um, earmarked to go to five deaf organisations and um, to work in advance to, to implement the provisions um, of, the, of the bill. Presiding officer, I think we've had a, a tremendous um, debate today. I believe that my bill will help to improve the lives of BSL users and in time help them come to better participate in all aspects of daily life. I hope come decision time that the whole chamber will support this bill and take uh, the next step towards introducing these benefits for uh, these improvements for the benefit of BSL users. Thank you. That concludes the debate on the British Sign Language Scotland Bill. Can I take this opportunity to thank our signers at the back of the chamber um, and the camera operator as well? The next item of business is consideration of motion number